Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. And now, story time. A few years ago, a group of friends and I went RV camping with my trailer together. The campground we wanted to go to was full, so we ended up RV camping deep into the forest, several miles away from any other campers. Well, the first night we woke up at about two in the morning to drumming and singing. It sounded like a traditional Native American type of song and music. I don't know how to describe it, but I got the feeling that something was very wrong. It was like the feeling you get when something bad happens. And the sound didn't sound like it was coming from anywhere in particular, but was just all around us. Anyways, we were completely freaked out and decided to sleep in our car. The next night we decided to go see if we could find any other campers near us that may have made the noise. We literally saw no sign of life anywhere around us, and we were in a somewhat clear part of the forest, so if anyone was camped near us, we would have seen them. We were still freaked out, but decided it was probably nothing so we spent another night. That night we woke up at the same time again to loud music, but it sounded closer this time. We also felt like something was just wrong, and were extremely freaked out. We were too freaked out to go to sleep so we just stayed in our tent awake all night. The next day when we woke up we decided to pack up and see if the other campground was open, and it was. When we stayed there nothing else happened. To this day I really don't have an explanation for what that noise was. I don't understand how we could have not seen any other campers and why they would have played music in the middle of the night. We also weren't on tribal land. My best friend who is one if the other campers is Navajo, and she said the music was similar to music she heard in tribal dance or rituals. I'm still freaked out about the whole ordeal, and it's hard to explain, but my body was just telling me that something was very wrong when this was happening. Used to camp all the time when I was a kid, but I moved away from the mountains for a while. This was my first camping trip in over 10 years and I was solo. It was a long drive to my destination and I had gotten a late start, so I pulled off on a national forest back road to camp for the night. It was twilight and I was getting ready to sleep in the truck stuffing my sleeping bag and air mattress in the back of the cab when I noticed that the woods are dead quiet. Not a bird, not a squirrel. I was well off any main roads. I didn't think too much of it until I heard a Stellar's J alarm call. Corvid's J's, crows and ravens, will alert to predators. I look up just in time to see a shape pass between two trees way the hell to close for comfort. Definitely an animal of some sort, but all I saw was the top of the hindquarters. No head, no tail, because of the brush and the angle of the trees. It was tawny, and my first thought was, dear. Until I realized that whatever the hell it was made no sound. None. The ground had years and years of leaf and pine needle build up. Deer crunch when walking through that. Only a predator moves that silently. Yep, it was a mountain lion. I figured that from its direction of travel. It would have to cross the creek I was next to, and I would see it as it left. It never crossed the creek. I hurried up getting my sleeping bag unrolled and stuffed in the truck, with the growing feeling that I was being watched. I finished and slammed the tailgate of the truck as hard as I could. I heard the cat make three big bounds away, then stop. I got in that truck and stayed there till morning. That was my most terrifying and thrilling experience in the woods while camping and I still camp alone most of the time. I've had bears walk past my tent and heard wolves howling on a hill above my campsite, but nothing compares to that mountain lion. Gallup is a border town on the Arizona or Mexico border on I-40, you cross into Arizona. It's an Indian reservation north. It's all Native American Navajo. I lived out there. 
I was married to a Navajo girl. I lived out in the south of Gallup. When you go south you go up in altitude. You go up about 8,000 feet, 85,000 feet. It's all pine trees in these mountains. Her family had land way out in the middle of nowhere. I mean it was beautiful. I can't even begin to describe where I was at. Very few Belladonna's white people. I was hunting out there. I got up really early one morning. Left the Hogan. We lived way out there. I took off and was actually looking for elk. It was that season, and I'm way up there in the mountains. I'm out there probably about 7 o'clock. The sun's coming up, and something's following me. I'm an ex-Navy corpsman. I know when something's following me. I'm about an hour and a half back in, and I'm way out in the middle of nowhere. So I go around and I end up on a box canyon on top of this mesa that overlooks the boonies. It's like a thousand foot drop off. Okay. Real quick, I head back towards the box canyon. I was trying to get away from whatever was following me. All of a sudden I hear these thundering footsteps, and I lean up against the wall, and here comes about seven horses out from the middle of nowhere into this box canyon. Wild horses. I get around the box canyon, and there it is. It jumps off the top of a 20-foot dead-end box canyon. I was at the bottom. I'm looking up and now I'm looking at it. And it jumped, one foot down, one foot up on the side. It was exactly what everybody says that you guys talk about Nori says Bigfoot yeah. And I'm in the middle of the Indian reservation on the top of a little mesa. It blew my mind. It looked right at me. I was less than 50 yards from it. I took off running. I didn't freeze. I took off running. I was armed to the hilt. I ran around the box canyon, and got out of the box canyon as quick as I could. Then something threw a rock at me. It was a huge rock. I'd say it weighed about 8 pounds. It would have killed me. I looked and I tripped out. At 120 to 200 yards there it was, and it looked at me. I'm telling you. It blew my mind. It threw an 8 pound rock at least 120 yards. And this thing was not small. This thing was huge. Okay? I was armed with a 270, 4x15x15. By 15 by 15, and I am a crack shot. Let me tell you what. I hit it. I hit it. It took two steps and poof it just disappeared into thin air. It was like it was never there. The footprints were there, but there was no blood. True story. Dude, I know I hit it. I watched it change expression. Nori asks how tall it was ah man, it had to have been eight and a half feet, probably weighed close to 600 pounds. I don't know where it's from, but wherever it came from, when I hit it, it had the ability to just disappear into thin air. You know I looked. I followed the footprints. I walked the 120 yards. It wasn't that far from the top of a mesa, it had nowhere to go. Never ever have I seen it again, and never ever have I gone back, not by myself. I thought camping in an RV was supposed to be safe. Have you ever had one of your favorite activities completely ruined for you, maybe forever, due to a negative memory associated with it? I do. I don't think I'll ever be able to sleep outside of anything that remotely resembles a house again, after one night in late June of 2019. My boyfriend, Tim, and I had been together for about two and a half years, and actually met due to some mutual friends who, like both of us, loved being outdoors. Hiking, biking, kayaking, camping, you name it, we'd do it, and probably have done it. Now, we're not really adverse to getting dirty or smelling horribly after spending days in the wilderness, but I would say that we try to avoid it if at all possible. For that reason, we decided, soon after moving in together, to buy a decent-sized RV trailer. He already drove a truck very useful for carrying outdoor gear or accessing remote-ish trails. So we invested a solid chunk of change in a 20-foot trailer. It was surprisingly pretty nice. I won't say it was the Ritz-Carlton of the camping trailer world, 
But it was better than sleeping on the ground with bugs and dirt, and who knows what else. The back of it had a bathroom with a toilet, shower, and window. The middle had a kitchen and couch that folded into a bed, and the front had another bed. No frills, but it got the job done. Because of the size of RV beds, we typically would use both beds if it was just the two of us. But we could squeeze into front bed together if necessary, or if we were in the mood. Starting in the spring of 2019, we took this thing all over the western half of the S. We both had jobs that allowed us to work remotely doing this before it was cool. So we had some pretty epic road trips for those first few months. Around Memorial Day, we wrapped up our trip and came home for a while, though had plans to head to my parents' house for the 4th of July. We lived on the West Coast, they lived back in the Midwest, so it'd entail a couple of days of driving. Rather than just driving as fast as we could, we decided to bring the trailer and made a week out of it, leaving near the end of June, with plans to see the Grand Canyon, painted desert, petrified forest, and a whole slew of other stops along the way. On our fourth day of the trip, after we'd done most of our sightseeing, we pulled over at an RV park somewhere east of Albuquerque. Now, I would like to apologize to any New Mexico residents that may read this, but we weren't exactly getting the best vibes from the state thus far. Most of the people had been friendly, but there were, like, a hundred too many, stop driving drunk signs for our liking, so we weren't exactly eager to stay if possible. Our accommodations for the night were on the outskirts of a small town, the kind where the streets were all numbered and one main avenue through town had the gas station, general store, and church on it. If you've ever traveled the S, no matter what part of the country you're in, you've been through hundreds of these. We rolled in as the sun was beginning to waver and drop below the brown, dusty mountainous peaks in the distance, creating a hazy light at dusk. We'd been able to establish a good routine, I got the steps and awning on the trailer set up. While Tim emptied the gray and black water tanks for lack of a better term, our used shower water and poo, respectively and replenished the clear water tanks. The campground was set up in a couple of large circles, mostly empty. There was a couple of large, 40-plus foot RBS set up on another side, and a few older couples at a fire pit in front of one of them, probably some people enjoying retirement, and a few other camping spots taken by vehicles or camps of varying sizes and elaborateness. The left side of our trailer was parallel to some thick brush and trees, so the right side, the one with the door, opened into the rest of the park. As I stood facing the RV, with all five foot four of me trying to reach and pull the awning down, I heard a hum of a motor approaching behind me. I turned to see a man on a quad bike approaching. Probably just some guy wheeling around because he's bored, I thought. I resumed work at the awning. I heard a shout behind me over the whine of the engine. Need a hand? I glanced over my shoulder and gave a half smile. No thanks, I got it. The man got off the bike anyway. He stood on the opposite end of the awning from me, reached up and pulled, extending the cover over the porch of the trailer. Oh, uh, thanks, I said sheepishly. He nodded. I eyed his clothing. He had a blue polo shirt, khaki shorts, and a black baseball cap on, with some sort of logo on it. He also had a belt with what appeared to be a gun. His eyes were sort of small and beady, and darted quickly around. There was a brief moment of silence as we gave each other a once-over. He squinted his eyes. I'm Marco, I work security here, he said suddenly. Oh, well, thanks. I replied, awkwardly. This guy was definitely making my spidey senses tingle, not in a good way, but I couldn't really figure out why. He just sort of walked away, without saying anything else, hopped back on the bike, and left, looking back over his shoulder and locking eyes with me for a few seconds before he left. I stood there for a minute, pondering. He's probably just kind of a socially awkward, 
weird dude I reassured myself, mentally, going back to finishing up the task at hand. I felt an arm reach around my waist and grab. I jumped, letting out a sharp yelp. Sorry, I heard Tim's voice behind me. I sighed, spun around, and smiled, rolling my eyes at him. A little jumpy tonight, aren't we? He laughed, kissing me. I playfully slapped his shoulder. Come on, let's get some dinner started, I said, opening the door to the trailer. As we ate a delicious, nutritious meal of hot dogs, Easy Mac, and pickles don't ask, I told him about my newfound friend, Marco. He doesn't sound from weird to MFME, Tim said with a mouthful of hot dog. I raised my eyebrows and laughed. Run that by me again, I giggled. He swallowed, wiping his mouth. I mean, what's so weird about him? He stared at you. I don't know, I just got the wrong vibe from him. And besides, how many RV parks have we ever stayed in that have security? He laughed. That would be none, but to be fair, we've been saying the whole time how weird of a state this is. Besides, I doubt the owners would let some creep run around pretending to be security. He had a point. We cleaned up from dinner, got ready for bed, and were soon out cold in our separate bunks, the only light coming from the moonlight outside that lit up the gravel parking lot. Tim took the front bunk, I took the rear bunk which was right behind the door. I awoke to the sound of the engine, the same one I heard earlier when putting the awning up. I rolled over and looked at the display of the clock on the microwave. 1.48 AM. Ugh, I just wanted to sleep and a TV magi out that was on patrol. I'm sure it's completely necessary for you to be doing that right now I thought facetiously. I shut my eyes, but the engine persisted, coming closer and closer to our trailer. Then, suddenly, it shut off. Silence. Finally, I get back to sleep. Tap, tap, tap. I froze. There was a tapping at the window literally right next to my bed. If I rolled over, my face would be a few inches from the glass. I could hear a faint, low, male voice from outside of the window. You need to come outside right now he kept repeating it too. I rolled onto my back, slow owly and peeked out of the corner of the blinds. You have to come outside. It was tough to see in the darkness, but the silhouette told me enough, it was definitely Marco, that weird security guard from before. My suspicions went from a slight weird vibe to, I'm about to call the cops on this guy, in the span of two seconds. Bring your husband too, it's urgent. What? I got closer to the glass. He repeated it again. You and your husband, come out, quietly, now. Before, I was convinced that this guy was some sort of rapist or something, now I wasn't sure. He either wanted to murder both of us, or he legitimately needed us for some, unfathomable reason. I still have no idea why. Maybe it was that aforementioned impeccable intuition, but I slowly stood up and crept towards the door, glancing over at Tim. He was both fast asleep and probably nude. I decided that if Marco had truly evil intentions, I could scream loud enough to wake Tim, and probably anyone in a half mile radius, so I left him sleeping peacefully. I silently opened the door and poked my head out. Marco stood crouched near my window, and turned his head towards me. There's someone in the trailer, Marco said bluntly, in a quiet voice. What? I whispered. Yeah, my boyfriend is asleep in there. I had no idea what this guy was talking about. No, there's someone else in there, he hissed urgently. In my half-asleep stupor, I still had no idea what was going on. I stepped down out of the trailer rubbing my eye, and let the door slam behind me, causing a loud bang. Marco winced and rushed over to the door. I heard a thudding in the back of the trailer, then a shout from within. Marco rushed in, pulling the gun from his hip. I was close behind. A man was standing on the bed that I'd just been sleeping on. He was short, with dark features, 
a torn pair of pants, and plain black t-shirt. He had long, scraggly hair. His right arm was outstretched, holding a long knife, but he wasn't really pointing it, he just sort of held it. It was pointed sideways, with the bottom of the blade facing the ceiling. That was creepy enough, but as we stepped into the trailer, he looked our way. He opened and closed his mouth a couple of times, before letting out the most bizarre scream I've ever heard. It wasn't high-pitched, it was almost like, if Kurt Cobain's drawn-out screaming in aneurysm, was done by a guy that made me a serial killer, and was currently threatening my boyfriend. Oh shit, my boyfriend. I hadn't even looked at him, though it had only been a couple of seconds. He had pulled the blanket up to cover most of him, and was holding a pan, which he must have grabbed off of the shelf next to his bed. Marco held up his gun, and the man took off, running to the back of the trailer, still screaming. The way he ran almost reminded me of an animal, he sort of trotted one leg at a time, leaning forward as he did, but with way more speed than you would expect. The door to the bathroom was opened, which must have been where he had hid. He proceeded through it, and in one fluid action, hopped from the seat of the toilet to the tank, then out the back window, landing somewhere in the bushes below. Marco ran out the door, chasing him around into the woods behind the trailer. I stood in the trailer, in a state of shock, as Tim sat up, in a similar wide-eyed state. I sat on the bed slowly next to him. We were silent for what felt like forever. He exhaled loudly. Yeah, I said, I know what you mean. He smiled slowly. The rest of the night was a blur. The police came and took statements from most of the people staying at the park. The owner didn't sleep there at night, he arrived and apologized profusely, refunding our fee for the night. Marco had chased the guy for a few minutes on foot, but lost him somewhere in the thicket. As far as I know, they never caught the guy, and they had never heard of any incidents similar to ours to where this guy may have been a, to put it lightly, repeat offender. Before we left, I asked Marco how he knew the guy was in our trailer. He explained that he typically patrolled on foot, and saw someone in the distance, near the bushes, so he got onto his bike, and made his way over to us. Around that time, he saw the guy climb into the bathroom window from the outside. That's when he woke me up at the window, trying to do so discreetly to not alert the creep that anyone knew he was in there. Both Tim and I thanked him repeatedly, but he insisted that it was just his job. The two of us were eager to get out of there, even having only slept for a couple of hours. We drove straight through to my parents' house, taking turns sleeping in the back seat of the truck while the other drove. Our perfect road trip had lost its luster, and we were ready to rid ourselves of any traces of it. Once we had arrived, before even going to my parents' house, the first thing we did was go to sell this trailer. Neither of us had any desire to keep the thing after what had happened, and frankly, I didn't think I would be camping again for a very, very long time. We pulled into the RV dealer, and were able to quickly get a salesperson to talk to. After making up some reasons for wanting to sell it something about needing the money for an addition on our house I think, we were a few signatures away from the trailer, and hopefully, the associated experiences, no longer being in our possession. Now, if you can just get me the title for the trailer, that will be all that we need, the salesman said. I'll go get it while you sign these, I said to Tim. In the glove box of the truck, right? He affirmed. I left the office and opened the passenger door to the truck, leaning on the seat as I popped the glove box open. It was kind of a mess, which was odd, because Tim usually kept it very organized. I rifled around it and found the document that I was looking for. As I pulled it out, a square of paper fell out and landed face down on the floor mat. I picked it up and turned it over, then my jaw dropped. It was a Polaroid photo, dated the night it had happened, taken of me asleep in bed.
I just wanted to share an incident that I experienced in Point Pleasant, West Virginia where I went to high school. I was in a video production class right around the time, the movie The Mothman Prophecies with Richard Gere was being made. So we decided to make a documentary. We spoke to a woman in her 70s who, during the time of the original sightings back in the 1960s, said that she was out riding her horse one day, and she said she suddenly felt someone sit down behind her. All of a sudden the horse bucked her off and went crazy. She chased the horse down and then looked at the horse. Burned into the flesh of the horse were the legs of a humanoid. She immediately got in contact with a veterinarian, who came to their farm to treat the horse. The veterinarian never asked how the horse got burned, as if he had seen this type of burn before. Other than the burn, the horse was fine. Later that week, she confided to a friend that whatever it was that sat behind her on the horse had very thin, insect-like legs. She also said that it had the odor of ammonia. She also said that when she was backed off the horse she caught a glimpse of the being on the horse. She saw a huge butterfly-like wings that were yellow in color. She swears up and down that this was the Mothman. Also, it turns out that the veterinarian was one of the 46 victims who died during the Silver Bridge collapse on December 15, 1967. I just thought that was an interesting story. This story is only partly a first-hand account. Events that may have led up to this point come from my friend group at the time. They were trustworthy, but I only saw this thing once. A lot of the really intense encounters with the paranormal for me, were in these Ozarks woods beside where my friends lived. As for the previous events, basically, I had this one friend who had had many encounters and dealings with various beasties, and I learned a lot from him. The other two friends believed but not as deeply. Poked hornets nest often, and just did all around stupid stuff. Found this old book on satanic witchcraft, not that in of itself is stupid, drew sigils willy-nilly, pronouncing Latin wrong started doing drugs experimentally cocaine and heroin but stopped and cleaned up. But they still did stupid stuff. They wanted tangible proof of this sort of thing. They found an abandoned shack in the woods, drew some summoning circle and red spray paint in a window, put some of their blood on it, and did a ritual of some sort. Nothing happens. A couple of weeks go by, and they are walking through the woods, and they get all panicky for no reason like their flight or fight goes into overdrive, and they get lost from the panic and see this thing in the treetops following them. They finally make it back home and tell my other friend the intelligent one what happened. He thought they were just freaking out and it was probably nothing. Another week goes by during which they tell me and we all make plans to hang out. We were outside chit chatting, smoking cigars and enjoying the night. All of a sudden I happen to look across to the other apartment building, and I see what looks like this massive hand gripping the roof and see this tail swaying, but it's giant. I asked them if they had seen it too, and they did. We go around trying to debunk this. The trees were down a hill and weren't visible from the other side, but then I saw these bright blue eyes look at us on a massive head. We go back towards where we were in case we need to bolt inside, and we can see better in the light. We keep watching, and this very muscular arm hoist up this thing on top of the roof, and it lays across it like a 15 foot long muscular cat. It was dark so it's hard to say for certain of the color, but it didn't have fur, and it looked dark grey. The head looked like it had horns, but again it was dark. There was definitely something there, but we weren't sure what. It gets off the roof and hear it slide on the gravel down the hill and tear back off into the trees. Nothing else spectacular happens that night and so ends my personal account. However, they told me later that the two buddies, who did the so-called ritual got so freaked out, they went back to the shack and destroyed the circle with a rock and didn't close the summoning. They refused to go hiking there anymore after they told us that they saw this, 
15 foot tall, skinny gargoyle, no wings, and blue eyes with no pupils, chased after them when they tried to go in. Something freaked them out because the edgy Satanists and militant atheists started attending evangelical Christian churches. The only thing I know for certain is what I saw, the rest could be completely made up. I researched Ozark's cryptids, but couldn't find anything that matched. My more experienced friend said he thinks they did summon a demon, and severed its way back, or hold they had on it so it attacked. I really don't know what it was. My friend grew up on the New River in West Virginia before the dam was built. Here is his story. When my friend was a kid about 10 years old, he and his friends would spend every day in the summer down in the river playing. The first year they had their interaction was when they all noticed unknown creatures in the woods across the river, which was 30-40 feet wide with slow moving water over rocks with wading pools. For about a week the kids noticed that these beings would move though the kids never really saw them. After a week they would be gone. Then again, the next year at about the same time, they had their second interaction, but this time the kids could see them. They stayed up in the woods, but allowed themselves to be seen. They never came closer that year, and they were gone. The next year the interaction got closer and closer every summer, till about the sixth year of this yearly interaction, the boys sat on one side of the water, and the family group of Sasquatch would sit on the other side of the water about 35 feet away from each other, while the small ones would play in the water. This lasted about a week, then they were gone for the year. The next summer the boys made sure that they were down there early, and sat down in the shallow water, just a few feet from the bank. This was the year that physical contact was made. The Sasquatch little ones and the mothers would sit beside the boys in the water, and the small ones splash about around the boys. This happened for about a week, and then they were gone. The boys were about 17 years old during the last year of interaction. It only lasted one day, and the boys never went back afterwards. The boys did some of the same routine, but this year they actually sat on the bank of the other side, and waited for them to come out of the woods. The Sasquatch did, and continued to interact with the boys. The one thing I left out was the extremely large male who led this family group. As they approached the river the Sasquatch would always wait for the large male to ascend a large rock that overlooked the area, but only a few feet away at all times. It was as if he was the overwatch, the leader, who stood well over 8 feet tall. The boys were fully grown young men by now, and they only came up to its lower chest. The big male was dark brown to black, but had a silver chest. The chest looked like it had an upside down triangle of silver hair, with the wider part of the triangle on the top, and narrowed as it went toward the waist. He controlled everything my friend said. The last time they had any interaction was the only day because my friend actually got on top of the rock where the silver chested male would stand. The male got on top of his rock and was only 5 feet away from my friend, and that is how he knew that it was almost 10 feet tall. My friend said he started to feel sick. That is when he was spoken to, not by voice, but he could hear in his head. I can eat you at any time, and there's nothing you or your friends can do about it. It was then the pungent smell overwhelmed him, almost like he was finally allowed to smell them and understand them. My friend backed away and put his head down as he moved off the rock. The other boys all started to wade across the water and slowly moved away from the family group. My friend says that after that he and his friends never went back down there. My friend told me this story about 8 years ago, but he is still involved in the church and refuses to come forward in fear of being excommunicated from the church. I respect and trust this man beyond a shadow of a doubt. So this is how it all started for me. The date was October 21, 2001 
And I was 17 years old, and in my bedroom at night, watching South Park at 9 p.m. I lived in Los Angeles, California. I was sitting on my bedroom floor with my back up against my bed. Just as the intro started to play I heard this hum that got louder and louder. I noticed that a blinding white light was coming from the cracks of my door. All of a sudden the door slowly opened, and the light filled my room. It was the brightest light I've ever seen. It blinded me. For some reason, I remember thinking it was my mother, so I reached up to put my hand up to grab her. But my arm felt like it was a million pounds and I collapsed. I never saw an entity this time, but then I totally blacked out. Next thing I know I'm right back where I was when I was watching TV, only I remember thinking I should have been on the ground slumped over because I collapsed. But I was back in the place where I was before I saw the light. I looked up at my clock, and it was 2.33 am. I remember it didn't feel like 5 hours had passed, it felt like it had been seconds since I saw the light and heard that hum. I looked down at both arms, and they were covered in bruises and scratch marks on my forearms. I felt exhausted, like there's no way I had just been asleep. I felt like I had run a marathon. After that night I had hundreds of experiences similar to this. Sleep paralysis as well, but those experiences were vastly different from the abduction type phenomena. It all came to an abrupt stop when turned 23 years old, in fact, on my birthday. That's a whole different story and, and of itself. I've always been troubled by this. I want to know what happened that night. To all who have open minds know that there really is something out there. What it is exactly I don't know. But it's something real. Rest assured. I was in the Boy Scouts, and one of the merit badges I was working on was Wilderness Survival. I was at our week-long campout and part of that merit badge requirement is to make your own makeshift shelter and sleep a couple miles away from the base campsite. There were about eight of us boys ID say, and the adult leader would leave us there to sleep for the night. Well I am already a pretty anxious person. And the days leading up to this had me a bit tense already. So of course halfway through the night, I suddenly hear from the other shelter, no please, get away, stop, don't. Then silence. I whisper shout, hey, no response. And it didn't even wake up anybody else. I quickly come to my senses that he was just sleep talking and having a bit of a night terror. But to this day I can't believe it didn't wake anybody else up, and that I was the only one to witness that, thinking we were all about to be murdered. In a rural area outside of Aguada, Puerto Rico, where I used to live, I saw a strange man with greenish hued translucent skin who didn't appear human. I was 22 years old when it happened and now I'm 45. I really think it was an alien. It could not walk that well, but a few things got my attention. It had the right hand on the left. What I mean the fingers were backward. Where there was supposed to be the pinky was the thumb. It also walked with difficulty, and when I looked at its feet, I saw that were the same as his hands in the wrong place. The skin was translucent. It looked really weak. I didn't feel scared. I just felt calm, and with the need to go where it was. When it talked to me, it was talking part with its lips and part in my mind. It asked me if I knew where the Arecibo Observatory was. The Arecibo Observatory is a radio telescope in the municipality of Arecibo, Puerto Rico. It is also the biggest in the world. I didn't have time to answer when I saw a blue flash of light, and I blacked out. I woke up sitting on the balcony of my house two hours later. When I saw at the time was around 10 p.m., and when I woke up it was 1.20 a.m. I would like to be hypnotized to know what happened to me during those two hours of lost time. I live in Philadelphia now, but I have a house in Puerto Rico where that happened. That was my craziest experience. It has stuck with me for all these years, but I believe it is time to find out what had really happened.
To sum up the worst week of my life. Don't fall for job scams posted on Craigslist. Edit. For those interested. I needed more money than I was making. And living in a shitty town where old folks go to die, opportunities did not abound. So I was stuck working in a restaurant with not much else on the horizon. F. I even had a meeting with career opportunities people at my college which amounted to a glorified Google sesh, where they taught me how to use snagajob.com and indeed. For more minimum wage jobs that didn't cut it for me. So, Craigslist was a last resort for me. I sent out one or two emails, and got a hit almost immediately. A dental office worker position that sounded great for me. I'd had some office work in the past which was my previous worst life experience, but that was due more to the senility of the madwoman in charge of the office, so I figured I was in the clear with this one. Hell, pay was even better than my previous office gig, so I responded back in the affirmative. I was speaking directly with the head dentist who planned to move from California to the shitty small town of prune juice and tombstones, and given his age and eccentricities, that all made sense in my mind. The guy was also Russian, so I brushed off some minor syntax issues in his emails, by reading them with a slight Russian accent. Mother F. I still get mad thinking about this. I don't really understand some of what he messaged me. He told me I'd be working from home for a few weeks, while he got his things in order for the move. So he'd be sending me some office materials including HP Elite Book 8470p Inteller Core i5 HP Portable All-in-One Printer, Scanner and Fax Machine Hard Drive for External Backup AVG Internet Security 2015 Intuit and QuickBooks Software Legit enough, so far. Then, the confusing part. Perhaps you may want to put some personal things in place before you start. I have decided to provide you with an upfront payment of $300 from your first week pay remaining will come in your first week check. I will include the total cost for the above materials both shipping and installation by the technician, as well as your upfront payment of $300. I will have certified check under my name mailed to you next week to cover the cost so you don't have to finance them from your personal earnings. This was my mental response, in this order. 1. Holy shit, that's a lot of money. 2. Wait, I'm the one paying the technician for installation and shipping these materials to me. Well, that kind of makes sense. I'm acting as his PA after all, so this is the sort of thing I might wind up doing when I'm actually working for him. Fraud was already on the precipice of my thoughts, but I brushed that off and proceeded under the assumption, I wasn't doing something incredibly stupid. I exchanged a few emails with him for clarification on the breakdown of the funds, and he got back to me in not much time explaining in some detail what my end of the work would entail. Cool, I didn't think a scammer would have done so much world building and have such detailed answers to my questions that all seem to make perfect sense, so onward and upward. It's worth noting that I'd asked my father and brother, both of whom were in the intelligence community, to do a little digging on this guy. They both came up with a real dentist by the same name in California, whose dental office had closed down. All the pieces really seemed in place. Next. The part where I am so stupid that I deserve everything that happened to me. He asks me to send moneygrams. For anyone unfamiliar, moneygrams are a great way to get cash to your pot dealer across the country via Walmarts. But whatever, this guy was in the process of moving, and maybe this is just how he settled outstanding financials, and he was proven to be at the very least a real person by my online snooping so. Onward, I guess. I deposited the first check he sent me. I used some cash from the check for these moneygrams. I'd talked to him on the phone several times at this point, and he did have a faintly. Something accent. I go to sleep. I wake up, and my world is on fire. Bank account in the negative. Check came back, 
forged. Penalty for depositing fake check. Money from MoneyGrams had already gone through. Check for the technician successfully deposited. One in $500 in the hole. I frantically call him, email him, text him. He assures me he is working to fix everything. He calls me and tells me to send more MoneyGrams. I tell him I'm not doing another goddamn thing until I receive the amount taken from me in cash. He is more difficult to understand now, but I can tell he is insisting I do my job. I hang the F up. He calls me at 4 AM, requesting I do more money gramming. I don't recall exactly what I growled on the phone, but it had something to do with my money. I'd worked really hard to have a $300 surplus in my bank account for the first time since college, and in just a few days, it was replaced with a bigger deficit than I had ever had. I spent a day in my bathrobe on the couch wondering how I could be so stupid. Then, two days later, my brother died of a heart attack. So that's really what punctuates this story, and makes it the worst week of my life. I don't have a good way of wrapping this all back around to some lesson learned, or a triumphant change in my outlook on things, because this was all at the start of this year, when everyone I knew was posting about how 2015 may have sucked, but 2016's gonna be the best year ever. How come none of those cunts died? Life is bullshit. Thanks for reading. Let me share a rather bizarre story, though it's not about me, but rather my boyfriend's peculiar adventure during his stint as a vegan. You see, he had decided to embrace a vegan lifestyle for a while, and during that time, he happened upon a Craigslist ad that promised a ridiculous amount of free tofu around 5 pounds or something of that sort. Intrigued by this unexpected tofu bounty, he couldn't resist the temptation. After all, in the world of vegans, tofu was practically a treasure trove. So, with enthusiasm and a rumbling stomach, he set off on his quest for the tofu, not expecting the strange twist his adventure was about to take. The address on Craigslist led him to a rather nondescript house, and he hesitantly knocked on the door. The door creaked open, and to his surprise, he was greeted by a little girl, no older than 10 or 11, she had a huge, menacing dog by her side, growling ominously at my boyfriend. It wasn't the warm welcome he had anticipated. Summoning his courage, he managed to stammer out that he had come for the tofu, as advertised. The little girl gave him a curious look, and then she suddenly disappeared back into the house. My boyfriend was left standing there, puzzled, as he listened to muffled conversations from inside. After about five long minutes, the door finally opened once more, but this time it was an elderly lady who appeared before him. She looked at him quizzically and then, without saying a word, handed him a crinkled Walmart bag filled with tofu. It was an odd exchange, to say the least. Eager to sample the spoils of his tofu quest, my boyfriend hurried back home with his treasure. But as he excitedly opened the bag, he made a shocking discovery. Every single piece of tofu in that bag had long since passed its expiration date, it was all from the year 2012. A mixture of disbelief, disappointment, and laughter washed over him as he stared at the expired tofu. It was as if this was the universe's way of reminding him that sometimes, things that seem too good to be true often are. Despite the tofu turning out to be a culinary time capsule, he couldn't help but chuckle at the absurdity of the entire experience. It was a lesson learned that day. Never expect too much from a Craigslist ad, especially when it comes to free tofu. Not really a horror story, but more of a WTF moment. I was looking for a dryer and a guy had a relatively nice looking one for $80 and lived in a nice neighborhood, so I figured, sure, why not? I showed up and examined the dryer. The drum part was clearly not mounted to the motor, and there was a bunch of bolts and a belt inside. 
The guy's ad said, in great working condition. I told him it clearly wasn't in working condition, and he said, sure it is, the guy who took out said it just needs to be reassembled. You're going to have it professionally installed, aren't you? The guy who installs it can just reassemble it. The whole situation was just really weird, and I left as soon as possible. So I was selling my drum set. Full basic kit back from elementary school. We found a seller. Got 250 for it. But this is where shit almost got serious. I'm about 16 at the time so I'm selling with my father with me, and we agree to have them come to our house. We set the kit up no issues, and then a white van comes by. What steps out is a 350 pound black man, easily could be a bouncer. A Bruce Lee Asian looking man follows him, then a thin white male after him. They looked like they were ready to beat the shit out of us, but they were some of the nicest people I've met. My dad afterwards pulls a damn pistol out of his pants like it's no big deal and says, well that was easy, then grabs a beer. Living back in the middle of the woods, I've had numerous campouts, basically involving typical campout tropes, but with the accessibility of plumbing and electricity not too far away. During one of these campouts a group of friends, and I played what we called Man Hunt, which is basically hide and seek in the moonlit woods, while only the hunter has a flashlight. We always played these kinds of games. One time while hiding out fairly far from the house, me and the people I was hiding with saw a flashlight and heard leaves rustling behind us opposite direction of the house where we knew the hunter was, and we all just booked it back towards the house screaming. I don't think it was anyone with malicious intent, but I was really young at the time, and it scared the shit out of me. But I'd believe the poor guy was probably just as scared from a bunch of children suddenly jumping up and screaming. This didn't stop us from continuing to play this game, so I guess it wasn't that scary, but as a child I remember it being a lot scarier. It was in 1952, and I was about 10 years old at the time. I was spending the summer at my aunt and uncle's summer house on Pretty Lake in Dousman, Wisconsin. The property bordered the small lagoon portion of the lake. I was playing in front of the house which was parallel to the lagoon. At some point, I got up and walked to the side of the house that was facing away from the lake. I saw about five things standing on top of each other trying to reach the bathroom window. The window was just a small opening that opened outwards and opened from the top, not the bottom. I was shocked that these bright, silver monkeys were trying to get into the house. I started running to go into the house and tell my aunt, and then everything went blank. I know that I never did tell her about the silver monkeys because in the evening, she was giving me a bath, and I asked her to close the window because I did not want the silver monkeys to come in. She said there were no silver monkeys. Have you ever heard of a similar sighting in the area? Scariest was camping with my wife when a windstorm blew up. I am talking trees being blown over, branches falling, the works. In a forest full of jack pine. The creepiest was camping with my best friend. We were in a semi-remote camping area. Drivable usually to get to it, but definitely only with a 4x4. It was a semi-maintained camping area, as in there were a couple of fire pits, a few rotten picnic tables, and a run-down outhouse. Parks check this place once a year or so. So we get there and start setting up when Buddy wanders over to the shitter and opens the door. He stands there for a second or two, and then closes the door and goes to the second one, goes in and comes out a few minutes later. He comes back to me and says go check out that first one. I assume someone shit on the floor or an animal got stuck in there and died or something. Nope. 
free full backpacks, and I am talking big bags, like the bag I have that size I use for week long trips, so we are nosy, we open them up, two are full of good quality gear, nothing unusual, the third is full of skittles, bulk bags, small bags, regular, tropical, sour, every flavor and size of bag you can imagine, just full of skittles, camp for four days, never saw a soul, bag still there when we left, we let the COS know when we got to civilization, who left all that gear, why did one person pack 80 liters of skittles, don't know, but it was weird, oh, another scary one, dog and I were backpacking, spur of the moment overnight trip, wasn't far off the road or anything, so I just have a tarp up as a small shelter, small little fire, wasn't really hiding per se but wasn't being obvious, just dozing off when I hear a truck rip up and a bunch of drunken voices, then the shooting started, now they probably didn't know I was there, I was parked on a different road and hadn't realized I had walked as close as I had to the second one. But I at all don't like being in the area when a bunch of drunken yahoos are shooting off guns. Especially when I was fairly certain they were shooting in my direction based on the lay of the land. So I put Pupper on a tight leash and headed out a SOP. It wasn't scary, but it was weird as hell. My brother roommate and I went camping out of the blue and got woken up in the middle of the night by some guy high off his ass banging around screaming. They woke me up and we listened as he approached our tent so my brother cocked his pistol and said we're sleeping go away. A few minutes later the cops come and tell him to drop the pole he had and all we hear is tasers and him drop to the ground and all that fun stuff. We had a good chuckle about it the next morning. I live with my partner and roommate, both of which are really into paranormal YouTube channels and shows. This is something they bond over. My roommate even has some tools that he has used even in our own house that is over a century old. I, on the other hand, have an appreciation for it, but I'm not as into it as they are. I'm also more skeptical than they are. Not to say that I don't believe it, because I absolutely do, but I try to look at things from an objective point of view. With that being said, a few months ago, I am pretty sure I encountered a ghost cat. My partner and I have three cats. I work from home and have been dubbed the crazy cat lady, so the cats and I are all very attuned to one another. It began with me thinking I see one of our cats out of the corner of my eye, but when I look, nothing is there. I then began to see the cat figure walk around out of the corner of my eye. This is when I was introduced to the second ghost cat. One of them looks to be black or dark, while the other looks white. I have never seen both cats at the same time. We have a white cat with gray markings, a brown tabby, and a black and white tuxedo. Sometimes, the ghost cats would do things my cats would normally do, so I chalked it up to being a muscle memory thing. Kind of like, I am used to them being there, so I feel like they are there. Until a few weeks ago, I was laying in bed when I thought I saw our white with grey spots cat dart across our room, something she would absolutely do. But when I sat up to talk to her, I didn't see her. I laid back down to see a white cat dart across the room the other way, up into a bedroom window, and I heard scratching or tapping at the window something my cat would not do. I slowly sat up, thinking it had to be my cat, only to see nothing. I tried telling myself that it's the muscle memory thing, but I couldn't get myself to believe that. I feel like it was white ghost cat. Because of the amount of minor encounters, I decided to bring it up to my partner and roommate. My partner says that he thinks he's seen them too, but he's too afraid to believe it because he feels like it's a bad entity trying to disguise itself as something innocent. I don't believe this whatsoever. 
My roommate thinks that I'm just so used to the cats, and I'm overthinking it. This was super disheartening, because I don't feel like I'm being overdramatic. I really believe I can feel them. I knew I had to make this post because not only were their comments eating me up inside, but just a little bit ago, I had a second encounter of one of them, I think black ghost cat touching me. I will sit at my desk to work and oftentimes, my cats will come and rub up on my legs, then I'll reach down to pet them. A few weeks ago when this happened, and I reached down to feel no cat, I thought it was the chair or my pant leg that just tricked me, but it just happened again. Now I feel fully convinced there is a black ghost cat and a white ghost cat that live in my house. My cats have never acted strangely towards them, which is another reason I don't believe they are bad entities disguised. I also think it could be one ghost cat, but I absolutely have seen both a black and white one, but never together. Thoughts? Am I being dramatic? Is this valid? This has happened to me like about two, three times. We recently moved into this new house. The house is actually my husband's grandpa's house. His grandpa built the house when he was younger, after. There was a couple who were renting the house. We renovated some things, but the house has always been in the family. Anyway, it started when I was sleeping in the second huge living room it has. I instantly woke up when I heard someone say, ooh, I can't tell if it was a man or a woman. Fast forward to another time. I go to sleep in that same living room, but then wake up and decide to continue sleeping in the smaller living room. I wake up to my husband opening the door and footsteps approaching. The whole time I am staring at the kitchen waiting for him to walk up. He never does. Then the third time, I am playing on the floor with my baby and our toddler. My toddler brings a toy over for me to fix, and as I'm fixing it, we hear the door open and footsteps. My toddler immediately gets up and says, Daddy. But no one was there. This confirms it for me that what I'm hearing isn't just in my head, because my toddler also got up thinking he heard the same thing. The house can't possibly be haunted because it's a family home. We know the entire history of it. It was built in 1963 for reference, so it is an older house. Any ideas on what this could be? This is something I've been experiencing on a regular basis for the last two or three years, but it has been happening way less frequently recently. It would maybe happen once every 6-12 months prior to that. What tends to happen is that, as I'm trying to fall asleep, I can feel animals running over me, or I can hear them or feel the weight of them crawling around the bed. The most common are mice or hamsters, or I guess just some kind of rodent since I can never fully see it. This is often also accompanied by a very slight shimmer or ripple in the air where I can feel or hear the animal. Sometimes I have to wake up and stay awake for 20 minutes or so. And when this happens, it looks like reality is shaking or not in place properly when I look around. So, I occupy myself until my surroundings look normal. I got to the point where I was able to ignore it and go to sleep, but I've just had to wake myself up because I could feel someone or something rubbing my feet, and I heard an alarm go off followed by some kind of Japanese announcement, I'm in the UK in addition to the animals. I am currently waiting for my surroundings to seem normal before I try to go back to sleep. If anyone has any insight into this, that would be great. Thanks. P.S. I've also had many other experiences where I've taken naps, and it feels like someone is touching me not inappropriately, and I could swear someone slapped me once. This is something I've been dealing with on a regular basis since I was 19 20 now 26, and I have no idea what to do with these experiences. I heard in the past that supernatural abilities like clairvoyance and pyrokinesis are most easily accessed when you put your brain in a trance-like state half asleep, half awake, so I'm not sure if that has anything to do with it either. Am I slipping between reality or something? Sometimes if I concentrate hard enough when I close my eyes, 
There's a wall of blinking eyes staring back at me, and even when my eyes are open, it's like there's something akin to wings with eyes, also blinking regularly, etched into my eye lens or retina, if I focus my eyes just right. I've also just seen the deja vu tag, and thought I should also mention that I've been experiencing it consistently since I was 11. Apologies for the dump. I'm very confused. Although I don't talk about this with people in real life, the feet rubbing thing was too weird for me to not at least post, and see if anyone has experienced something similar. I went to pick up a liquor shot dispenser from a guy who was giving it away free on Craigslist. I get to the guy's apartment, and he asks me to wait in the living room, while he grabs it out of his bedroom. It's at this time that I notice he clearly has some money. The apartment is pretty large for a New York City one bedroom, and there's a grand piano in the main room. This is also when I noticed that there's also a number of lavender scented candles laying lit around the place. Not that weird, maybe the dude just likes lavender. Well, that's why. He comes out holding the drink dispenser. Completely naked. Would you care for a drink, he asks. No. His face sinks, and I very slowly step over and gently take the dispenser from his hands and walk backwards out of the apartment. I'm a guy by the way. Sold a couch and love seat set on Craigslist for cheap, and offered to drop them off. I couldn't show up the day I promised, but made it two days later. When I got there and brought in the furniture she choked up and started crying. Well, it turns out the pictures looked a bit better than the actual furniture honestly didn't mean to. I sold them for cheap and said they were in fair decent condition. What made this bad is that because I came two days late she had already donated her better looking furniture and was now stuck with worse furniture that she also had to pay for. I felt really bad and offered to bring the price down significantly, but she denied and said it was her fault. I still felt bad. Story time. When I was a young teen, there was a small forest fairly near our house. My neighbor and I would walk to it regularly to go build dens and play on the park near its edge. The land was clearly once part of an estate because it had an old 1900s looking swimming pool and bits of stone path dotted amid the undergrowth. We'd sometimes take other kids there and play chase games or pretend to be tribes people, sprinting through the thick foliage. It was a fun place to explore especially after we discovered where the stash of crispy old woods porn was. It looked like it was from the 70s. Anyway, we'd been going there for about a year or so at weekends when we finally decided to take a big pair of garden shears to start clearing an area for our biggest den yet. We chose part of the forest that had always been blocked off to us because it was mostly surrounded by a thick wall of bamboo, overgrown from the place's time as an estate I think. The forest was a paradise just for us, we'd never ever seen anybody there other than us or people we brought. The porn in our dens were always exactly as we left them. But all the same, we figured cutting a secret way into the bamboo walled area would give the best protected den from strangers and barbarians and ninjas. It took us most of the day to cut our way in. When we'd made an arch to crawl through, we went in to find that we were in a clearing with only clovers growing in it. No taller plants, just a soft blanket of clovers. Dotted throughout were these odd little knee-high statues of fairies sitting on stone mushrooms playing harps and other instruments. Every single one had its face smashed off. In the center of the cramped clearing was a giant concrete-looking block. We kicked over one of the fairy statues on the way over to it, probably to demonstrate that we weren't scared. It was a giant rough stone coffin. Some ivy-like plant covered most of it, but it clearly had a well-defined lid and a worn, unreadable inscription on the side. Adrenaline curious, we tried with all our might to lift the lid, but it must have weighed tons. The adrenaline wore off, we freaked out, 
and hurriedly walked back through to the play park where we sat and discussed our find for a bit. We decided the clearing was too den perfect to pass up, so the next day we returned with some old metal sheeting and plywood boards to build our shelter. It wasn't raining, but the day was heavily dark and overcast, so the woods were about at the darkest they could be during daytime. We got back into the clearing, started building, and got pretty far with it. After a little while my friend sort of yelped out an oh Jesus Christ. I turned to see him stood next to the coffin, it's giving me full body shivers just thinking about this, and it was open. The lid was slid off to one side just enough that a thin person could get through the gap. I ran over, stared into the gap, saw nothing but pitch dark, and whispered run. The wind rose and it started raining, so there was noise everywhere right at that moment. I've never experienced anything like it. We ran through the wood faster than we'd ever practiced in our tribe games. We never went back into those woods. Anyway, we went back earlier and everything was totally overgrown. Also seeing as I'm now 6 foot 5 inches it was even harder to move around. We managed to find some of the landmarks but every path I remember leading to or near the clover clearing was now gone. We spent a few hours getting lost and they're trying to find ways around the back of it, but unfortunately it looks like it's gone until some new kid cuts their way in. Oh, and of course the woodspawn has long since dissolved away. Sorry, no vampires, but I can tell you it was creepy, particularly the way that the clearing seemed inaccessible and the fact that that cabin seems to have sprung from nowhere. I understand that a story like this may come off as unbelievable, which is one of the reasons why I've never told anybody about it for quite a long time. With the entire world and the state that it is in, I figured now is probably a better time to share my story. Now, for a little information about myself, I'm 30 years old. I've been an active duty park ranger for the past six and a half years in one of America's national parks. Before that, I served four years in the U.S. Marine Corps. During my tenure in both, I held numerous security clearances, received extensive training on protecting sensitive information, and worked with various federal agencies, including NSA and DHS, to name a couple. Those are just the outliers of things I've done and people I've worked with, but by no means do I consider it a bragging right. Basically, I know how to keep my mouth shut about sensitive information when necessary. Consider the fact that if there was a chance of somebody believing me or the story getting out in public, it would have happened by now, I'm sure. Now, let's get to the meat and potatoes. About five years ago, I was a very young ranger in one of our national parks, which I will not name. It's a very popular place for hikers and campers. At that time, my duties were pretty much relegated to being a rover, patrolling the trails and checking up on campsites. I was not a full-fledged ranger but more of an assistant. I would shadow and assist many of the rangers while on duty, doing various forms of work, including search and rescue. In addition to that, I was tasked with safety briefings when tours from the visitor centers brought in folks. At this point, it should be noted that most of my co-workers at this early stage of my career were much older than me, by double or triple. While I'm not trying to whine about this, it played a role in how things planned out later on. One morning during the summer season, I was asked to do safety briefings for a group of visitors who had been touring the area assigned to me that day. The briefing itself wasn't anything special, and everything went smoothly enough. After the tour, I went back to my usual trail and continued with what I needed to do. The trail was not anything too special, just yet another trail looping around the base of the mountain leading off into some woods. A couple of other trails were branching off, but they were pretty unnoticeable unless you were specifically looking for them. A few hours later, I finished up all my tasks and decided to take a nice break on one of our overlooked points, kind of like an observation deck. It was nice, with a shade covering over half of it, making sitting very comfortable. After sitting down, I noticed somebody coming down the trail behind me in the distance. I didn't pay much attention to it, thinking as long as they don't come near me, 
We coexist just fine. As they got closer, I realized this person was wearing all black with a hood over their head. Normally, this wouldn't be anything special past the halfway point of my break, but what caught my attention was that this person had a very strange gait, almost as if they were floating on the ground. They showed no signs of breathing difficulty or tiredness in their legs. They moved robotically, with precision and execution that looked unnatural. I only had my awareness at half capacity because of my break, so I wasn't paying much attention. But as they got about 10 feet away, I tried to make small talk with them. They said nothing back, but their head turned slowly towards me. It took a few seconds for this whole exchange to happen, but when it did, this figure looked straight down at me, since I was sitting, and kept walking forward without missing a beat. I was horrified when I got a look at their face. It was like staring into the face of Emperor Palpatine, deformed and grey looking. It was terrifying, and even their eyes looked unnatural. They just kept on going, and that is what really made me notice their movements. It all just looked so wrong. I pulled my head away for a second to grab my radio. When I looked back up, they were suddenly gone. I remember sitting there, thinking to myself, okay, there was no way they could have disappeared so fast. There's nowhere on or off the trail that they could go to fully conceal themselves, not like that. To make a long story short, I got the creeps and decided to get out of there. Originally, I was going to radio back about this person, but the whole thing was so weird that I could not shake it off. So, now you're probably wondering why I am sharing this. Well, because two days after this happened, another ranger came up to me and told me about an experience he had while patrolling an area near where I was at. He also got weirded out by my story too, apparently. They found a dead deer on the side of the trails. When they approached the body, this deer had all of its organs and blood completely removed. The deer had not been cut open, and there were no signs of flies or any decay, even though it had been dead for well over 12 hours. There were no bite marks, puncture wounds, or anything that would indicate it had been cut open in any way. It was as if somebody had killed this deer and just dumped it on the trail. Upon closer examination, they could not find the cause of death or how this deer died. It was as if it had suddenly fallen over and died, yet its eyes, tongue, heart, lungs, and other organs were all missing. There were also no tracks or any sign of a struggle when they found the deer. So, I guess the real reason I'm sharing this is that I want to know what you guys think about it. If any of you have had experiences like mine or have heard about weird things happening in the area, I would love to know. Thank you for reading my post, and feel free to discuss these events further. This happened not so late ago, maybe a few days. My name is Carl and I had this trip planned for three weeks. Me and my friends got on the meeting point and got in the car to finally start the trip we have always wanted. It was me, Josh, Carla, and Mark, and luckily they all made or to bring as much camping supplies for this, given that we believed it was better safe than sorry. It was a long two-hour drive until we reached our destination. I think it was called Marshland Campground or something. I didn't really pay much attention to the sign since I wasn't the one driving. After we reached a good location, we got our things unloaded and started setting up camp, first our tents and then some other things like parking the car on a better position and then gathering things for a campfire. As we finished and sat down to talk, a park ranger showed up from a nearby trail. He looked like your average park ranger, and with his grumpy voice spoke to us. Hey kiddos, I know you're all settled down to camp and all but I do tell you that some places are off limits, Terry signs and all that crap saying it, so take my word and don't venture off. Of course, some pretty standard stuff, maybe some preservation areas where visitors were not allowed to camp or visit. After he walked away, we continued to chat like nothing happened. After a bit of talking we decided to hike on the trail and see if there was any place to visit like a souvenir shop or a local shop. As we went, we saw some parts that were boarded with tall metal frames and electric fences. Upon a closer look, 
There were signs like the ranger said, it read stay off, dangerous wildlife in the area. Along with symbols of different animals like wolves, foxes, spiders, bears, and something I couldn't make off, it looked like a quadrupedal animal of sorts that I didn't know about. Me and Josh joked about them keeping monsters hidden in the forest, getting a laugh together. As the night fell early, it started to rain heavily, probably a storm, so we rushed into our tents, and since the group wasn't sleepy just yet we kept chatting through our phones since signal was still present. We heard some loud sounds outside and went to investigate, it was coming from far away from our camp, maybe a vehicle? We got our raincoats and flashlights, Josh also got us some hunting knives just in case, along with bear spray. We tried to locate the source of the sound and, as we hid in the bushes, we saw some staff opening a huge gate inside the prohibited area, as they sent animals like cows and pigs inside. Of course, this was already sketchy enough, but we couldn't exactly assume what they were doing, but the next thing we heard was the sound of said animals apparently running around, the sound of shock as a few of them ended up running to the electrical fence. We wanted to run away, but curiosity got the best of us as we stayed hidden to watch it all. We saw the light posts that illuminated the trail starting to flicker, and soon the place was dark save for the headlights of the truck. Lightning striked every so often, and we saw something move in the prohibited area, it was quadrupedal, had a muscular back and if I could guess was around the size of a large horse, but that's all we could see. Soon a deafening roar echoed around as the side of metal clanks started being heard. If that couldn't be worse, we also heard the staff screaming. We saw faintly one trying to get into the truck before being pulled back by something. It was an impossible to see, but definitively gruesome horror show. We saw a lit up flashlight illuminating in one direction, and that's when we saw it. Quadrupedal, a long body, probably 25 or more feet in length, definitively carnivore, six eyes and two tails. What the hell is that thing? Was all I could think of upon seeing that beast and its snout bloody with someone's arm still hanging in its mouth. Another lightning struck and we could see for a moment that it tore its way through the metal frames and fence. So the moment the light posts were off, it wasn't just a flicker. It was a full power outage and thus it could get through the electric fence without problems. We had to escape, we had knives but it probably wouldn't do anything to it, but there was no way we could escape given it was still around. Then. It saw us. We had no option but to run inside the prohibited area as it took some time to turn. We ran as fast as we could and not even seeing where we were headed to, we just wanted to escape. I faintly kept hearing its roars as it rushed through the foliage hunting us. Eventually we almost got to hide, almost, except for Mark, who tripped and we couldn't save him. We only kept running as it got hold of him and his screams echoed in our minds as we tried to hide in the foliage. We hid inside some large bushes, hoping it would not see us. After waiting for what felt like an eternity, we decided to get I and make our way to the car. As we were about to turn it on, we heard cackling sounds, and when we looked back, it was staring at us from outside. The moment we sped up it gave chase, somehow keeping up with the car. Then it slammed itself into the car, causing us to spin over and crash it to the side of the road. Now we're in the worst situation, face to face with it, I don't even know what we could do other than hold my knife and pray it would go away. Then a small tremor was felt and it looked to the side, and a bigger one similar to it showed up, leading it away. The horror struck us upon realizing the horrible truth. It was a juveline. And it wasn't an individual but a species. I don't really know how to start this. I was watching a YouTube video that made me think I should probably share my experience. This happened during my sophomore or junior year of high school, so almost three years ago. I live in rural western North Carolina, and I'm the first stop for the bus route. However, my bus stop is probably a quarter mile away from my house, as our neighborhood is on a hill with a big private drive that leads up to the houses. Every morning, around 6.50, 
I would walk out of my driveway and down to the bus stop and wait, it's pitch black down there, by the way, with only my phone flashlight to guide me. Every day, I would stand and wait, most of the time listening to music or just looking at my phone. It always felt eerie being in the dark alone like that, but I've always felt uncomfortable in the dark. One morning, as I was walking down the hill, it's a steep, long hill, by the way, I only made it about a quarter of the way down when I heard a scraping noise, almost like nails on sheet metal. Originally, I didn't think much of it and just slowed down a little. Then it happened again, all of this happened within 30 seconds, mind you, and by instinct, I stopped in my tracks. My heart started pounding from the noise, making me nervous, and I began to hear loud rustling at the tree line on my left side. Before I knew it, something pale, white, human-shaped, and maybe deer-sized ran out of the wood line into the small yard next to me. I turned and ran so fast I didn't get to look for long, as it triggered my fight-or-flight response. I ran all the way back up the hill, jumped over every step on my porch, and went straight into my house, truly fearing for my life and hyperventilating. Mind you, I'm a large guy, about 5 foot 11, 250 pounds. I don't get spooked easily, but I remember running and letting out a reflexive wail of fear. It's all I could do as I ran, and to this day, I never walk in my neighborhood in the dark. I was scared so badly that I found another way to get to school besides the bus and shortly after got my license. I just want to hear what you all think. I've only told my mom and my friends, and I'm more than willing to post pictures of where it happened as I still live here. I don't know what it is. I've lived in the same house for the last 18 years and it's only gotten worse. I live in an old coal mining town in Pennsylvania. I know my house is haunted, but I believe that to be beside the point. Something is stalking my family. The first encounter I had was in the early 2010s. I heard my name being called repeatedly from far away and it sounded like my friend. Started walking towards home and turned because I felt I was being watched. I saw a dark, humanoid figure that was at least 7 to 8 feet tall. I ran home. Things were fairly quiet as far as I can remember up until the last few years. Recently, things have been amping up. It started as rustling in the woods and the feeling of being watched. Next came the deer. So. Many. Deer. There was one I recall seeing multiple times in the same spot for a few days on my way home that just didn't look right. The most recent encounters has left me researching what to do. Two nights ago my mom saw a pale white face with glowing eyes pressed up against the front door. She said she froze in fear and didn't know what to do. Tonight I got home after dark and walked toward my house. Seconds after I locked my car I heard a blood-curdling scream come from the train tracks followed by a very calm voice yelling help me very loudly. I froze in fear for a solid 15 seconds just listening. I slowly walked up my porch steps just listening to two different voices screaming, one frantic and screeching while the other was calm and just called out help me. I yelled in the front door for my mom because the frantic voice sounded vaguely like my youngest sister, but I thought maybe she was messing around. When she came outside it grew quiet and the frantic voice had stopped. We heard help me one or two more times faintly than nothing. My sister was at a friend's house and it wasn't her. We went to pick up dinner and there were deer everywhere. Now, this isn't uncommon for PA to see a ton of deer, but like I said before, these ones were weird. They stared right at you and didn't run from the car, even if they were in the middle of the road. Someone please tell me WTF is going on. What are these things? I live in the Klamath Mountains in eastern Oregon, about 20 miles from the California border. Growing up I spent a lot of time outside camping, hunting, fishing, etc. A few months ago I had a strange experience on a family trip to our cabin near Crater Lake and wanted to see if anyone could help me maybe find more info on what I saw. I was by myself bird watching at a small pond in the woods maybe half a mile from the cabin in the late afternoon. 
I was sitting on a big log with binoculars. I wasn't in a blind or anything but I picked a spot where I thought I'd be less visible to any animals. After about an hour I hadn't seen much except a few common ducks and it didn't seem like many animals were very active so I was thinking about leaving. This was about an hour before sunset. Then I saw something move in the trees across the pond, probably a hundred feet away. It was just a flash between trees and I didn't really get any kind of look at it. But I kept watching the spot and after maybe five minutes saw something dart from one tree to another. It was bigger than most any local bird except maybe a heron and moved very fast, without making any noise, but I still didn't really know what I was looking at. This happened again a few minutes later, and then again a few minutes after that. Each time it was moving closer and closer to the pond. I don't think it knew I was there but it was staying incredibly well hidden, and only revealed itself for a split second at a time. At this point I'm thinking maybe it's a kit fox or a pine marten because of how fast and silently it moved. But I still hadn't got a good look at any part of it in detail. It moved between trees a few more times until it was behind a big dead tree right on the shore. I was staying as still and silent as possible but still worried it would see or more likely smell me and spook. But after a few more minutes I saw something move at the edge of the water. A little arm and hand that looked just like a human's reached out and touched the mud, and then the head and the other arm came into view as it leaned out to drink from the water. I could only see the head and shoulders and arms from where I was, but they looked so much like a person's. Except it was too small, and covered in what I took as grayish brown fur. The face wasn't exactly human, more monkey-like, but it was too far away to see much detail. I decided to try lifting my binoculars to get a closer look, but as soon as I moved it looked up and then disappeared back behind the tree again. I watched until it started to get dark, but I didn't see it again, not even darting behind the trees. I went back to the cabin and told my grandpa what I saw. He's been a rancher in this area his whole life. He said sounds like you ran into a hide behind and laughed. I said no grandpa seriously, this isn't a joke. He said he'd heard stories about Bigfoot and hide behinds and several times saw little human footprints on hunting trips deep in the mountains where no children would be. I think he believed me but he didn't really know anything. I asked my dad and brothers but they just started giving me shit about squatching lol. I went back to the pond the next day and walked around to where the creature had been, but I didn't find any tracks or scat or fur or anything. I did figure it had to be probably about three and a half or four feet tall based on the trees I'd seen it near, but narrow enough to hide completely behind a ponderosa pine. Which makes me think it must have been standing and moving upright. And that's it. I wish I'd seen more of it, but that face and hands were absolutely not like any local animal. It looked very much like a monkey or furry little human. I've tried to find more info but the only cryptid people seriously talk about in this area is Bigfoot. The hide behind seems like a joke. There may be little people or humanoids in some of the local Native Americans folklore but not a lot of detail I could find. I hope someone here has some ideas what I might have seen. It was a very unique and memorable experience and any further information would be appreciated very much. My step-grandfather had a very hard life. He grew up with his many many sibling being passed around through homes and orphanages. He would usually tell me a lot of funny stories because I was still young before he passed. But one story was different and I didn't remember it until just now, when I found out that this sub existed. I have no proof other than my word. One night, when he was 10 or so, he'd gone to bed at one of the orphanages he once stayed at. It was really late at night and he was having a hard time sleeping. But when he did fall asleep he had weird dreams where he made it sound like he was having an out of body experience. He was seeing himself sleeping in his bed that night like he was in the body of another person entirely. He described it like he was standing over himself, so I have to assume he was much taller. Then it all ends because he wakes up and opens his eyes. He said standing over him surrounding his bed, only the back end was touching the wall, were five or so really tall dark people. 
Dark as in shadowy. He couldn't see their faces at all. He said he didn't feel scared, and that he closed his eyes again. Then he said he fell asleep again and woke up in the morning. That was how he ended the story. No payoff. He never told the story to me again and he's been dead for a long time so there's no way to find out anything else. Based on vague memories of how he ended up telling me the story, I believe he was trying to say they were aliens. As a kid I remember saying that's awful at the end, because I think at the time I thought he was implying they had hurt him in a bad way. But looking back I don't think he meant it as a scary story. He was very quiet after. My step-grandfather was great. He was a father figure for me and I think I just wanted to share his story to honor him. I miss him a lot, and I do want to take his word for it here. I don't remember him as a liar, especially when communicating with me. When I was young, I lived in the sticks in Vardaman, Mississippi. We had a cow pasture, and I would always go out there to play with my sister or cousins. However, when I was out there with only my dog, I felt as if I was being watched by someone, or something. I thought there was something out there, so I named it Thing. The grass out there was about 5 feet high, making it really hard to see anything, and I would hear the occasional whisper of Thing. The presence didn't seem threatening. It felt calm and collected, like it just wanted to watch me. Once, I caught a faint glimpse of it before it ducked down to avoid being seen. I would say it was about six feet tall, hairy, and resembled Bigfoot in a way. After a while, I moved away and never really thought about it again. But I think it is still back there. It was December 24, 1987. My family went to visit my great aunt in Wilmington, Delaware as we often did, for Christmas. Her husband had died in the house some 20 years earlier. After dinner my brother and I went to sleep in one of the upstairs bedrooms. I went to sleep on the left side of the bed which was closest to the door. My great aunt has a thing where she hated her doors to be shut and absolutely not to be locked so it was wide open as we drifted off. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sounds of something on the roof. I was seven and had just about given up my belief in Santa but it really sounded like footsteps. Could it be him? I tried to wake up my brother but to no avail. Shortly thereafter I turned to my left to see a figure just outside of the doorway. It was human shaped with its arms stretched towards the frame. It was completely black. I know someone was there because it was darker than the surrounding shadows cast in the hall. The only person in the house that was that large was my father. Supposing it was him I said dad? No response. At this this point I was starting to get scared and focused on its head to see its face. The only feature I could make out were two red points of light where the eyes should have been. It was then that I realized that I had messed up by speaking aloud and letting it know I was awake. I have rarely before or since felt such dread. I reached to my right to try and wake up my older brother. Again, no dice. I was alone with this thing three feet away from me. The only thing I could think to do was to pull the blanket over my head, pretend that I was sleeping, and hope to God that it hadn't heard me. Several minutes later I peered under the blankets and it was gone. About five years later I was riding to school with my brother and mom and I worked up enough nerve to tell them about it. I knew it could have been my imagination so I told them with an air of levity. When I was done they were silent for about two minutes. When I asked my mom what was wrong she turned towards me in the back seat and said we've seen him, too. When I was a kid, probably in first or maybe second grade, I was sitting on the couch in our old trailer with my backpack on. It was a double wide, so I could easily look across through the wall opening to the dining room from the couch in the living room. This wasn't far away at all, given the small space. As I sat there, waiting for my mom to finish drying her hair, she had huge, fluffy hair because it was the 90s, lol, I looked up and directly in front of me, standing, or floating? Behind the dining room table, 
was this solid black figure. I looked at him, and he turned to look at me. We made eye contact, or at least something resembling it because his eyes were like two burning red holes. When our eyes met, time felt like it stopped, and I experienced the most complete terror I have ever felt, even to this day. Frankly, I've been through a statistically improbable number of really terrifying things, but nothing compares to that feeling. I was completely frozen, absolutely terrified. After what felt like an eternity within a moment, he turned and kind of floated out the end of the trailer. As soon as it ended and he was gone, I immediately jumped up and ran screaming to my mother. I told her what just happened, and she assured me that it was okay, that it was just my grandpa. I insisted to her that he absolutely was not my grandpa. We're from Appalachia, so ghosts and things like that are well accepted as real, although it is also understood that sometimes people make things up for the sake of a tall tale. Yes, ghosts are real, but one has to approach them with an attitude of discernment. Anyway, I still can't make sense of it at all. About a decade ago, in my early 20s, I found a story online about shadow men, with hats? And that really shook me up because it was the first time I encountered somebody talking about something similar to what I experienced. However, I haven't ever seen any accounts of this specific figure. The sheer terror I felt, completely consumed by fear, gives me an indication that whatever this thing was, it was not kind or good. Does anyone have any similar experiences? Back in 2021, a friend and I were splitting rent on a tiny farmhouse in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico while working. Anytime she was away from her room or out of the house, her door was open. One night, I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up hearing her call me from outside, saying that she needed help. She sounded absolutely terrified. I started to jump up and run to the back door, but something in my brain said to look at her door. It was firmly closed. I noped right to my bedroom, a grown-ass woman, and climbed into my bed, putting my covers over my head. The next morning, she said she had been in her room all night and had never heard a thing. I can't testify to the existence or non-existence of skinwalkers, but New Mexico made me believe in them. I never went outside late at night by myself again while we were there. Okay, so this happened earlier this year. My partner and I were coming back from delivering papers, which we always do late at night as we both work during the day. It was about 10 PM when we were walking back and saw a little girl who looked about nine walking down the street. I thought it was weird. Why would someone let their young kid walk around so late? I said to my partner that we should go see if she needed help. But then suddenly it was no longer a little girl. It was a grown man. The little girl transformed into a man right in front of us. We decided to stay back behind him a bit until he was out of sight. That was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in my life. I had never experienced seeing shadow people until a few weeks ago. I woke up to see one walking into my bedroom closet before dissolving into the background. I've always been skeptical of the supernatural. I have a BS degree and follow a scientific way of thinking. I knew I had just woken up when I saw them, so I figured I was just hallucinating. Now, last night, I woke up and jumped up in my bed because I saw another one crossing the room to go into my closet. The difference this time is that my jumping up woke my cat next to me, who I saw tracking the movement of the shadow person. Am I in danger? Am I being haunted? I've been freaking out a little bit about this. About two months ago, my husband, 34 male, and I, 29 female, were staying in a camper on a friend's property in northern Wisconsin. One night, I wasn't feeling very well, so I went and laid down in the camper and promptly fell asleep. A few hours later, Around 3 a.m., I suddenly woke up and bolted out the door, starting to projectile vomit outside by the window. 
My husband called out and asked if I was okay. I managed to say, yeah, in between rounds. When I finally finished and felt like I was okay to go back and lay down, I spit a few more times to get rid of the taste, and as I looked up, there was a face about three feet in front of me in the darkness. I stared at it, and it at me. I was petrified, unable to move, but also afraid to take my eyes off of it. I slowly started to move my head up, down, and side to side to try and get a better angle or a closer look, and as I did so, it began to mimic my movements. There we were in the darkness of the forest, bobbing up, down, back, forth, slowly leaning closer and closer to one another as we tried to figure each other out. I stared straight into its cold, hollow eyes, unable to look away in fear of what would happen if I did. It stared back at me, almost as if it didn't know what I was either. It was too dark to make out any features, but the face had the shape of a human face. From what I could see on the body from behind the truck, it looked hunched over and distorted. We stayed that way for what felt like forever until I finally managed to call out, Babe. Yeah, my husband responded. There is something out here, I said, only slightly raising my voice. What? He asked. I don't know. Some kind of animal? I'm not sure, but I'm afraid to move. It's just watching me, I whispered almost to myself. He opened the door of the camper and looked out into the darkness. Where? He asked, unable to see what I was seeing. It's right in front of me, just watching, I told him, bewildered that he couldn't see it. He grabbed a flashlight and shined it in front of me, and it was gone. There was nothing there. I never saw it leave. I kept its cold, dead gaze the whole time. How could it not be there? I am still very confused by this interaction. I know it was there. I saw it. It wasn't a dream. And I know I wasn't hallucinating. Can anybody tell me what they think it was? Edit, just to respond to a few comments. I don't drink, and I don't do drugs, so I was not inebriated. I don't remember all the details because I couldn't see very well, but here's what I got. I couldn't tell how tall it was because from what I could see, it looked hunched over and disfigured. I don't think it had any fur, it was pale in color, but again, it was dark, so I'm not sure what color it was. It had big black, soulless eyes, like looking straight into a void. It had sharp jagged teeth, and I don't remember a nose at all. I hope this description helps. Maybe it wasn't a skinwalker because I guess they don't leave Navajo land, but it was really scary. I should also mention that where I was in the woods of Wisconsin was not too far from the Hannibal Indian Reservation in Menominee County, Michigan, but again, not Navajo, so I'm not sure what it was. I'd like to preface this with the fact that I have no idea exactly who or what it was that I saw, but it's pretty spooky regardless of whether or not it has an earthly explanation and that's the part that continues to haunt me, 10 plus years later. I grew up in Sleepy Hollow, New York, home of the Headless Horseman, and allegedly a number of other hauntings. I was 16 at the time and riding shotgun in my then boyfriend's car, Headed home on old Sleepy Hollow Road at 3 a.m., this was before my parents enforced a curfew because I was taking advantage. At the end of old Sleepy Hollow Road is Sleepy Hollow Road, and a stop sign, at which making a left brings you through a densely wooded area to my parents' house. Old Sleepy Hollow Road is dark and curvy, and cuts through the woods that contain the old carriage trails which connect to the cemetery where the headless horseman is laid to rest and said to ride, as well as where some of the other legends of Sleepy Hollow originated. Not many cars frequent this road. Outside of tourist season, the village is quiet and the houses back there are quite sparse. This was the case even more so about 10 years ago. There weren't, and still aren't, many lights on these back roads, but there is one right next to the stop sign, almost like a spotlight. When we pulled up to the stop sign, I got such a fright because a young woman wearing nothing but a long white nightgown or otherwise thin white dress was very suddenly standing on the road right next to the stop sign. At first I was scared that we were going to hit her, 
But when we drove away the reality of the situation really started to sink in and that's when I felt extremely unsettled. What was she doing there at 3 am? It gave me a heavy pit in my stomach. This was around November in New York, it was quite frigid, and she had no jacket or any shoes on. There are houses back there, but not many. She didn't look directly at us at all, despite us almost hitting her, it almost seemed like she was staring straight through or beyond us. She was unblinking and unmoving. Very pale, with the cliché long dark hair to match. I remember asking my boyfriend if he just saw what I saw, and he just nodded. We never spoke about it again, until many years later when I confirmed with him that it really happened and wasn't just a figment or a dream or something. My parents live up against those woods, with my room on the bottom floor. I don't think I slept in my own room for months after that incident. I still think of it when I visit. I've read a lot about this figure and different accounts of it. There are stories of ladies in white across many cultures, but one thing that many of the tales have in common is the betrayal of a lover. This boyfriend was my first love, and unbeknownst to me at the time, he was secretly banging my best friend behind my back. To this day it remains one of the worst betrayals of my life. Eventually he became very violent towards me. I can't help but wonder if she was a warning of some sort? Of course, there are other related ghost stories in the immediate vicinity of where this occurred. Like the woman who froze to death at Raven Rock where she sought refuge during a harsh winter storm, a colonial woman who died hiding from a violent suitor, a Native American girl who was killed at the hands of her jealous lover, a teenager who died after being pushed out of her boyfriend's car during an argument. Hulda of Bohemia's homestead was in those woods, a quick 15-minute walk from my parents' house. I doubt it was her, by the way, but she has a very sad and incredible story associated with her for those who are interested, my fave Sleepy Hollow figure. Truthfully, the list of the many supposed apparitions of the area could go on for far longer. The happy ending I guess is that I dumped that loser and I grew up to work in the morgue. I definitely don't scare easily, and while I've had a few other unusual experiences throughout my life, this one is truly a mystery to me. I think of it every time I drive past that stop sign, and I sometimes still have dreams about it, as was the case last night, so I've resolved to get it all out and writing in an attempt to unload it to some internet strangers. Feel free to share your opinion or theories or similar stories, skeptic or not. For context, I am highly skeptical, but no stranger to the paranormal. I'm the type that believe demons exist, but most ghost stories are overreactions of easily explained phenomena or simply hoaxes. About three months ago I started working security for a hotel that was built back in the 1920s by a major hotel chain that has changed hands multiple times and is now owned by one of the biggest hotel chains. I'm not saying which so the company can't sue me. Now from what I've been told paranormal activity is not a common occurrence in the hotel, but some years back the Make-A-Wish Foundation started sending some children here because well it's a major resort at one of the most popular beaches on the east coast why wouldn't they? However the hotel was not informed of this and didn't realize what was happening until several children died in their rooms over the course of a few weeks. Supposedly on quiet nights you can hear children playing with a ball in the North Tower ballrooms at night. For years guests complained of children playing ball loudly next to their rooms even and when security would check there would be no one there. This has not happened in a while, but going into this story you should understand that my opinion on the cause of what I've seen may be warped by being told this story. Now every shift we do a floor check, especially on night shift when I work. At first I never noticed anything strange, I got a little creeped out by the quiet of the floors at night but nothing supernatural. The hotel has two separate towers separated by a restaurant and shopping area that connects them. About a month into the job and suddenly I started feeling like something was following me on my floor checks especially in the ST which is the biggest and tallest and where I understand most jumpers choose because all the rooms facing the ocean have sliding glass doors with a short railing in front and you can put the rest together from there. 
Anyway it got really bad in October, maybe the spooky season had an effect on me, but this feeling of being watched and followed never went away. As the weeks have gone on, I started seeing distorted faces in windows as I passed by to the point I no longer look at them. The floor pattern sometimes reflects on the glass and the mind could easily make a face with the pattern, but some of these faces were up further on the glass where this wouldn't have been possible. When I focus up there sometimes I can almost hear whispers in the back of my mind, urging me to unalive myself or lambasting me for the mistakes I've made or even telling me insecurities I have about myself I've never told anyone about. In the last few weeks some strange physical and auditory phenomena have occurred. Part of what we do on floor checks is close doors we find open, and some of the doors lately have been more difficult to close, one in particular I had to use all my strength to slam shut. The ice machines on each floor sometimes make a banging noise while in operation so I usually attribute any noise I hear from the vending area to that but sometimes it almost has sounded like something was rummaging in the garbage cans and when I'd go to investigate I'd hold my keys so they wouldn't jingle in case it was a person, and as soon as I do the rummaging noise will stop. On a couple of occasions I've felt what I can only describe as hands touching me while closing certain doors sometimes just a tickle and other times a brush against the back of my hand and even a feeling like someone on the other side of the door is pulling it in the opposite direction against me. I now dread the floor checks especially after 3 am I'm not trying to make this seem scarier than it is, but these things intensify the closer it gets to that hour. Whatever they are they aren't friendly and I think they know I can sense them. They really don't like that I can sense them, like some nights that watched and followed feeling is more like a burning hatred directed towards my existence, like being stalked by an enemy or a predator. I'm pretty religious, and whenever. These things happen I always pray to God and when I do it usually goes away whatever it is. The scariest thing though is the last time it was that intense I heard something growl next to my ear. I've never been hurt by them so my assumption is they can't hurt anyone physically, but they try to communicate often and want their presence acknowledged. Almost as though that's where their power comes from. My grandmother told me once that demons truly have no power, they are only capable of whatever we believe them to be capable of. My mounting fear is feeding them whatever they are. My experiences could be just m seeing things or looking too much into something completely explainable I don't know this is just what I've seen and heard. Whatever it is hunting me at night my co-workers don't know about it, or at least they aren't telling anyone. I am bipolar, but medicated and I've never had hallucinations. Maybe I'm just crazy and seeing things, but if that's the case why am I not having any other signs of a manic episode or psychosis and why am I only seeing things in that one part of the building? Hi everyone. I wanted to share my experience with a fairy when I was a child. I'm currently 19, and all my life I've been obsessed with fairies. As a kid, I read books about them, research them, and left offerings out to them in my backyard. And one time I saw one with no doubt. I was about 9 to 10 years old and I was at my cottage. This cottage is about 3 hours north of Toronto. The cottage has a huge forest in its backyard, and I was alone waiting at the top of the stairs leading into the forest. Suddenly, a tiny creature flew up to my face. I can't fully picture it, but I know it was mainly brown with long limbs and wings. It had a human-like face, and it made a motion with its hand saying come here or follow me and then it flew off towards the front of my cottage. I've had other smaller supernatural experiences at this cottage, but this one changed my life. Or solidified my belief in fairies, and even now, almost 10 years later I still doubt it. Let me know if you guys have any other similar experiences, and thank you for reading. I feel like something was trying to warn me. When I woke up, there was red writing all over the ceiling. It looked like computer programming code, but amongst this, there were glowing words in English. However, my brain almost couldn't register what it was saying, but all I felt was dread. I looked to the left of me and saw the entrance to this bridge that is in my city. 
It also felt like there were a few people standing around watching me, but I couldn't see them. After about 15 seconds or so, all of this disappeared. I knew I was awake the whole time. It wasn't just some weird dream, it at least felt extremely real. The reason I feel like it's a warning is because of two things. Recently, I connected with someone from a city that is on the other side of this bridge, whom I am due to meet. And later on next month, my cousin is getting married, also over the bridge. All morning, I have been trying to work out if it is just some paranoid hallucination or whether I should take this seriously. When I checked the time after, it was exactly 2 am, exactly 1 hour after I fell asleep at 1 am. I found it strange how it was exactly an hour after. I managed to get back to sleep after an hour or so, but I feel like I've got my guard up. I googled the entrance to the bridge, and it is exactly the same as what I saw. I've never been a spiritual person or anything like that, but this felt so real. I've never experienced anything remotely like this. So this happened years ago in about 2019. I was over at a friend's house. We had a good amount of people to play with their Ouija board, maybe five or so people. I want to preface this by mentioning the board we were using was used before to summon the well-known Ouija demon known as Zozo, by the person who owned the board. They supposedly sold their soul to Zozo for the demon to protect them from their biggest fear, which was being in a car crash or something similar to do with cars in that way. Anyways, we started playing. We circled the board with a planchette to warm the board up, and began asking questions. It began to answer, responding yes to if there was a spirit with us, and answering basic questions such as its name, how old it was and why it died which it gave answers to, I believe the first spirit had answered hospital. The group I was playing with began to ask dumb and all too playful questions and not taking it seriously, even making fun of me when I chastised them for not being serious about it, so I stopped playing with them after a while. I remember their non-serious nature went on for a while, but as they continued to ask questions, they all had gone silent and had seemed to become entranced by the board, deeply focusing and having a very very long session with it. I had tuned out mostly at this point, hanging out with my other friend on the couch who had also not opted into the session. This wasn't that I wasn't interested in playing, I just had no tolerance for the group not taking the game seriously, as I've always experienced paranormal shit since I was a baby in every single one of my households I had lived in prior, and was really sensitive to the paranormal. This was my first experience with the board, before I was followed by something. I asked to borrow the Ouija board, and my friend gave me permission. This marks the next time I played the board, which, this is going to be very dumb and cliche, but the day was Friday the 13th, and I decided on playing in Cal Anderson Park in Capitol Hill in Seattle, Washington. My friend and I took the board to the park, and I managed to find a few strangers to play with, my next mistake. We sat down and circled the board, I took to asking the questions. The spirit I managed to contact began to give me random letters, as opposed to the previous session having clear English written out. I asked if this was Latin, as I knew if the board began speaking Latin, you're supposed to end the session. It answered yes, then I asked if it was a negative spirit, it answered yes. Then I, my next mistake, asked IT permission if I could end the session. It told me no. Then began to circle the board in wide circles. I got really uncomfortable, and tried to push the planchette to goodbye, and a strong force pushed against the planchette, not allowing me to pull it to goodbye. I did manage to push it to goodbye after some more force, and told the spirit it was not allowed to contact me again. I cut contact with the session, and flipped the board, believing the session was cut off, but left with a deep feeling of dread in my stomach, like something wasn't right. And that feeling was correct. My ex and I kept the board at his house in his shed for some time after that, because when we kept it in his house, strange things would happen such as footsteps, doors closing and opening, knocks underneath the floor, his doorknob wiggling, and other happenings. We returned the board to the original owner after this, 
the one who had summoned Zozo with it, we didn't want it around anymore and the owner had wanted it back. After all of this, a spirit followed me home. I would hear footsteps running up and down my stairs outside of my bedroom. I would wake up freezing cold with a deep feeling of dread and a figure at the foot of my bed. One night there was heavy banging noises in the garage, which my parents blamed on me, to which I frantically responded see. Something isn't right, something did follow me home from the Ouija board, they began believing me more that night after the banging. I was so scared during this time that I sprinkled salt around my entire bed and doorframe, smudged with white sage, before I knew it was closed practice, slept with crosses and a Bible on my bedside table and prayed to God every night. I became extremely spiritual around this time because I honestly had no idea what else to do or where to turn. I just wanted the haunting to stop. One morning, my ex and I heard my mom knock on my bedroom door and ask us why are you guys sleeping still? And he got aggravated at my mom waking us up so early, I checked the time and it was 7 am, which is really unlike my mom to be wondering why we were still sleeping at that time. When I went upstairs, a bit annoyed, to ask her about it, she was on FaceTime with my sister's kids in the living room, and had no idea what I was talking about. My mom isn't the type to prank me like that or lie, and she was really busy with the FaceTime call at the time it happened. I honestly think back and wonder if whatever asked us why we were sleeping was mimicking my mom or was an entirely different woman's voice and we had just chalked it up to being my mom since that's the only lady in the house. The thought still makes me sick honestly. The person who owned the board who summoned demons with it was also extremely troubled and ended up unaliving himself a year or two after I stopped being friends with them. I haven't touched a Ouija board since, and the experience left me with some trauma. I still sleep with the lights on. I still did continue use with my pendulums, tarot cards, practiced with gems, and scrying. But I never touched a board again, and I never will. The concept interests me still. And the fact I did have such a profound experience I'm not sure if I'm morbidly lucky to have had, I'm just glad that thing that had followed me home stopped contact after some time. I recently came across your video from years ago about the invisible manta ray. I have had a similar experience in the past, but instead of being outside, it was inside my house. I saw it floating in a high corner, almost like a living creature. It seemed to be analyzing me, which really freaked me out. I tried not to look at it, hoping it would disappear, and eventually, it did. I've considered various explanations for what I saw, such as a creature that lives in the air, similar to those in the sea. I've even thought it could be a UFO or an angel. It was such a bizarre experience that I never bothered to look it up, but stumbling upon your posts has brought back those feelings of fear and fascination. I just wanted to share this with you. I just want to share a couple of my own fairy encounters that I 100% believe to be true and not my imagination. I'd love to hear if anyone has any other similar stories. In the first grade, I slept over at my friend's house. We had engaged in a lot of fairy hunting activities, more like trying to summon them. We made fairy houses, watched Tinker Bell, chanted, anything you could imagine. So, I wake up and check my surroundings to see if anything had changed since I had gone to bed. In my peripheral vision, I see a little figure more or less hovering above the ground, smaller than a finger. It was black and had wings. My shoe, with laces, was sitting on the ground, and the bedroom door was open. The figure flew out the door, but on its way out, it grabbed my shoelace and pulled my shoe onto its side and closer to the door. Unfortunately, my friend did not see it, and she still does not believe me because her sister had been the one responding to our fairy letters the whole time. But it would have been impossible for her sister to have done it. The second time I saw one, around fifth grade, it was a very similar experience. I was outside in the carport when, once again, I saw something in my peripheral vision, a small black figure hovering above the ground, flying very fast. 
I saw it go into some short shrubs, it was not windy, and I heard and saw it push the leaves out of its way. My sister was there, but once again, did not see it. Lastly, in high school, I dove back into fairies. I researched them and did all the things to try and interact with them again. I was outside during twilight with my friend, literally talking about them when we heard the most magical, peculiar sound, which, to us, sounded like it was coming from an old tree stump. Imagine if Maybell flowers, lily of the valley, could ring, and there were one thousands of them. That is what we heard, a soft and higher pitched sound. We both heard it. We went to investigate where it was coming from, and there were no birds or bugs that we could see. Neither of us had heard a sound like it before, nor have we heard one since. Honestly, hearing this sound is even more convincing than actually seeing them the times before. My brother and dad told me this story of their experience after they had gotten back from one of their snowmobiling trips. We live in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm not sure which mountain they went up to for their snowmobiling this night. They were riding their snowmobiles down a road with fresh snow, and it hadn't snowed for a couple of hours. As they were riding, they ended up encountering what appeared to be a perfectly built, brightly lit campfire, right in the middle of the road, in the middle of the dark. There were no footprints leading out on any side of the fire, no car tracks, and no sign of any human, just a picture-perfect campfire. There wasn't any way snow could have covered any signs of people being around, as I mentioned before, it hadn't snowed for a while. They didn't stick around to find out, though, as they were thoroughly creeped out and quickly continued on their way. I think about it frequently, they had no explanation for where the campfire had to have come from. Story time. In April 2003 my unit was part of the Iraq invasion. We were slowly moving north to Baghdad for about a week in HMMWVS, and had set up a perimeter for the night at some random spot in the desert. Our normal devil-may-care attitudes were oddly replaced with anxiousness. There was nothing but sandstorms and wild dogs howling all night. I had a surreal sense of time having frozen, and we we just walking around with the world on pause. We were on edge all night, and I slept maybe 20 minutes. We kept seeing movement in the distance, but our command had insisted we were clear. Eventually the night turned back to day, and we packed up and drove away through a road littered with corpses we hadn't seen due to the dark and sandstorm. I wasn't serving, but my father is an officer in the Navy, has been for a long time. We were stationed in a naval base in Maine. Our house on the naval base was the second oldest, built at the very start of the 1800s. Among some other creepy shit, there were two instances that actually scared me so bad, I still remember them very vividly. And I was only 10 or 11 then. I was usually getting up around 5.30 to get ready for school bus came very early so it was always pitch black out. The house itself was basically a mansion, huge with five floors counting the basement. My room was on the second floor, and when you walked out you could see all the way up a staircase next to it to the top floor. All the way at the back of this top floor was a bathroom. One morning I got out and swear to God, I saw the ghost of a woman in a large Victorian style dress standing in the bathroom just staring at me. I skipped breakfast, and just waited it out at the bus stop for the next 20 minutes, despite it being below freezing. It was worth it. When leaving the house in a panic I couldn't look back, felt very strongly it was watching me from that bathroom window on the top floor. The other incident was honestly even worse. I was on the first floor in the kitchen eating breakfast. The back door to the house was in a small room behind the kitchen, I sat with my back to it. Normally I was too tired in the morning to be scared, but one morning as I finished my breakfast, I heard the back door fly open, and a very loud gust of wind blow into the house. The door had a distinct sound, 
I knew what it was, and I never even looked back. My head was buzzing which had never happened since as I ran upstairs to my parents' bedroom, woke up my mom, and was delirious with panic. She told me I was being over-imaginative, and told me to go get dressed and head off to school. I usually used the back door to leave, so mustering up the courage to go back was difficult to say the least. The door was shut, but I swear the room felt very cold compared to the rest of the house, as if the door had been recently opened this was the middle of winter like the previous story. I made peace with whatever was going on there later, but that's a different story. I heard the tenants who lived there after we moved away never had any experiences like that. But I think I either put the spirits away for good, or, more likely, nobody wants to talk about it, because whenever I bring it up I sound like a paranoid F. As a Navy SEAL, I've been on countless missions in the darkest corners of the world, tasked with eradicating threats that lurk in the shadows. This particular mission however, etched a chilling memory into the core of my being, forever altering my perception of reality. Our orders were straightforward. Infiltrate and destroy a drug cartel's base nestled deep in the heart of the Colombian jungle. Little did we know that beneath the cloak of the cartel's criminal activities, an ancient evil lay dormant, waiting to be uncovered. As we stealthily made our way through the dense foliage, we noticed peculiar symbols and statues surrounding the perimeter of the supposed drug trafficking base. Grim reapers, adorned in various colors, stood as macabre sentinels, warning us that we were dealing with more than just a criminal enterprise. The air was thick with an ominous energy, and a feeling of unease settled over our team. Pushing deeper into the compound, we stumbled upon a hidden laboratory and it became apparent that this was no ordinary drug cartel. Strange rituals were evident, and it was clear that a cult, steeped in the worship of an ancient evil, was operating within these walls. Our mission had just taken an unexpected turn into the realm of the supernatural. We wasted no time in purging the base, engaging in intense firefights with well-trained mercenaries and seizing caches of illicit drugs. The eerie statues seemed to watch our every move, their hollow eyes following our progression through the compound. Amid the chaos, the unexpected occurred. One of our team members, hardened and battle-tested, was ambushed by a creature straight from the depths of nightmares. With red eyes glowing in the darkness, the humanoid creature moved with an unnatural grace. It appeared from nearby woods and pounced on our comrade, sinking its teeth into his ear, before swiftly disappearing into the woods. We immediately called for a medic, the urgency in our voices reflecting the gravity of the situation. The wounded soldier was pale and shaken, blood oozing from the bizarre wound on his ear. The medic, a seasoned professional accustomed to patching up battle wounds, furrowed his brow in confusion. Examining the bite, he declared it unlike anything he had encountered. No human or animal, he deduced, could produce such a wound. A shiver ran down my spine as I considered the implications. The encounter with the mysterious creature lingered in our minds, a haunting reminder that the line between the physical and the supernatural was perilously thin. Second-hand knowledge of modern-day sailors staying at the original Navy barracks that were strafed during the Pearl Harbor attack. One sailor ran out of toilet paper in the otherwise unknockabied bathroom, and a roll was thrown to him over the top of the stall from unknown hands. I also heard of another sailor that was on watch, and he went missing for over an hour. He blacked out, and when he woke up laying on the carpet. Everything around him was drenched, but he was dry. He didn't remember anything. Maybe some Navy guys from Hawaii can substantiate this, but I have heard the barracks are spooky. I worked in a lab in a military hospital. A relatively old military hospital. 
When I started working there all my co-workers military and civilian would tell me stories of odd and paranormal happenings in said land. Usually it was that typical doors shutting, lights flickering, odd noises type of thing. Well I never really believed in all that, plus it seemed like a hazing thing so I just smiled and carried on. Well fast forward about a year, I'm fully trained on all the sections and am assigned to the night shift. Essentially I work all one in the lab from 15-1, I'm completely alone. For the first months it's completely normal. Well all of the sudden at about the 6 month mark wired stuff starts happening. The lights, noises etc. But nothing that I couldn't really say was for sure unexplainable. Well after a week of weirdness, I'm sitting a desk in the center of core lab, just looking at some paperwork during a lull. I hear what sounds like footsteps, and the door opening to what sounds like micro, it's on the other side of the lab maybe 10 meters away, but there are shelves and stuff in the way of direct sight. At that point I assume it's cleaning maintenance, or possibly a co-worker who came back. So I get up to check just because I'm curious. I walk over to get a line of sight, and I see the back of a tall man in a white lab coat walk into micro. This at the time wasn't super weird, but still odd since I didn't recognize him, at least from behind. So I go in there to see who it is. Micro was empty, completely empty. I saw him go in, and there isn't another exit or entrance. At this point I'm a little freaked out, but managed to work the rest of my shift with loosing it. I mean I know what I saw, but maybe I was just tired or something I don't know. Well next day I mention it to some co-workers. They seem just as terrified as I should be. They then proceed to explain how Micro's supervisor husband had died many years ago, and that there's a rumor that he still hangs around. Micro's supervisor is this really really old lady who has been there a very long time. At this point several things start to make sense and freak me out even more. The person I saw was wearing a white lab coat. We all wear blue lab coats, the lab used to wear white lab coats in the ADS. This man was really tall, apparently the supervisor dead husband was really tall. He or it whatever was walking into micro. Seriously, I'm still freaking out about it now. I still can't explain it. I was stationed on an aircraft carrier, and living on board made me convinced that it was haunted. In particular, I had a friend that was a corpsman medic for all the non-navy types. It was around 21, and I decided to pay him a visit in the sick bay, because he was on duty. I went away I normally didn't. It was basically the back door. As I was walking around to go to the front office where he was, I happened to glance at the ceiling, and I saw what I could only describe as a shadow on the ceiling. It crawled at a high rate of speed and the next thing I know it shot into the surgical area. I ran like a bat out of hell to the front office. When I told my friend, he at once knew what I was talking about. Apparently, it was a very known occurrence. I'll try my best to recall this story that just popped into my memory randomly. This would have been in the late 90s in Connecticut maybe about 1998. I was a teenager, and some of my friends had started getting driver's licenses, so we did what any teen in the 90s did, drive around with our friends looking for something to do in a small town. There were about five of us in a friend's car, I wasn't driving, I was on the passenger side in the back seat. We were riding around, listening to music, talking, no substances were used. We were on a wooded windy road at night, suddenly the driver slammed on her brakes, and we watched as this creature crossed in front of us. Illuminated by the headlights, the creature was about toddler height, very very pale, no clothing, bald, very slender. It paused briefly to look at us, I remember we all got dead silent. It passed the road quickly and went into the woods. It walked on two legs, it was most certainly not an animal I'd ever seen, 
especially since it was bipedal, and it definitely wasn't a little kid. The only thing I can't recall is its face, I did see the creature, but from my seat in the car my view was slightly obstructed. We were all silent for a few moments, processing what we'd seen. I remember another passenger whispered, dude what the f, we continued on in silence with the occasional, did you see that thing? We kept the radio off at that point, and the driver started bringing us all to our homes. We were so creeped out we didn't feel like having fun anymore. One of our friends nicknamed it El Chalupa Lol so occasionally we'd bring it up. I've lost touch with all of them at this point I'm in my 40s now, but we never did find out what we saw. This was before most of us had even home computers, let alone a cell phone or Google. Any ideas? For starters, I grew up in southwest Saskatchewan, and moved on to my aunt's farm in 2019 to live in the other house that is on their property. The house is fairly old, but I loved it. It wasn't long after I moved in though that I started to feel uneasy in the house alone. I would close every window when it got dark, as it felt like something was watching me through them every night. Eventually, I decided to get a puppy to keep myself company when my boyfriend at the time was at work, or away from the house. It helped to have the company, but I always dreaded having to take her outside when it was dark. For a bit of scene setting, our house sat on the left side of the gravel road. At the back of the house, there was about 10 meters of backyard, and then there was the cow pasture and the cow barn. We didn't own cows, but in the summer another farmer would rent our pasture space, and so we would have them on the property. It wasn't uncommon at night to hear coyotes surround the farm either. And there were tons. Every so often when I'd go out with my puppy, we'd hear them all around us, too close for comfort. We had a farm dog too, who would keep the coyotes away for the most part as she was huge. But every so often she'd wander elsewhere on the property to scout and the coyotes would get a little too close for comfort. They always tried to lure my puppy out to them, but luckily I kept her leashed. Now, one thing you should know about my pup is that it takes her forever to find a spot to go potty. This is still a problem today, four years later, but back then it was the bane of my existence. She would pace for at least five minutes, and that was only after finding a suitable spot. Sometimes we would be out there for damn near a half hour, just so she would go and not go in the house, another problem of hers. Huskies, am I right? On this particular night, it was raining pretty heavily. I was not happy to be out there, and she had decided that she wasn't gonna go until she found her perfect spot. We had already been out for 15 minutes, and at this point she was also getting frustrated with the rain and wanted to go inside but I wanted her to go before we went in, since we'd already been out there for so long. So, as any annoyed puppy mother would do, I started getting a little frustrated, and would repeat, go go potty, every time she'd get distracted from her objective. It was dark, I was cold and annoyed, and to make matters worse the cows behind us were fussing fairly loudly. This was out of the ordinary for them, they were usually quiet and sleeping at this time of night. I was also hearing what sounded like a strange bird whistling, but shook it off as probably being an owl. I tried to keep it off my mind as I kept shouting and pleading, go, through the rain to my small fuzzy white asshole. I was facing away from the pasture, and suddenly in my left ear I heard it. Go. Now, one thing you should know about me is, I have a very strong flight response typically, but this froze me on the spot, as I was mostly confused at WTF I'd just heard. I tried telling myself I didn't hear it. I tried telling myself that it was just a moo from a cow that I heard wrong. But again, as if spoken directly behind me, I heard it again. Go. Go. It sounded unnatural. It was as if it came from someone who had never spoken a word before. A raspy, deep, monotone go. It almost sounded like it was coming out of an old radio, 
but of course there were no radios out there. Every time it said it, it sounded the exact same as the first time it was said. And whatever it was had started repeating it, as if it had been taught its new favorite word. At this point I spun around to the pasture to find nothing there. Then, again from behind me, go. This had all happened in the span of about three seconds, and at this point I remember shouting out loud, All right, don't have to tell me twice, as I picked up my little furball and made a mad dash for my front door. I swiftly locked both doors behind me and sat bewildered in my kitchen. Puppy went back to puppying immediately, obviously unbothered by it all and happy mum wasn't making her stay out in the rain any longer. I picked up my phone and called my aunt, asking her if my uncle had been out in the field with the cows. She said no, and I explained to her what had just happened to me. She sent my uncle over to the pasture to check it out, but soon after told me he hadn't seen or heard anything. He said he'd check the pasture again in the morning. I spent my night hiding from the windows, with the lights and TV on loud enough to not hear anything outside. The next morning when my uncle checked on the pasture, he found two calves dead. Explains the colossal cow panic that had ensued the night before. I regret this, but I didn't push for more information as I honestly just didn't want to know. But they told me other than that they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. A few months later I moved off the farm. I couldn't be in that house alone anymore, and my boyfriend and I had parted ways. A few months after that, I started going to therapy for the paranoia this had caused me. I started feeling like people were watching me, out to get me. Another few months after that, I moved out of the province for good, and finally felt safe. I'm wondering if any of you here have any idea what the hell this would have been. There's no chance there would have been someone in our field, as we were fairly far away from town and neighbors and we have cameras that would have seen anyone enter our property. Coyotes are common, but I don't think they are capable of mimicking words lol. Any ideas? Now, since moving I've had some weird related things happen as well, but can save it for another time if wanted. This is my father's story. He was a tank commander in Israel during the Yom Kippur War, which was disastrous during the first days for Israel. Throughout the war, he survived the destruction of seven tanks where he was the sole or one of two survivors, he was the guy looking out the hatch, when the tank got shelled, he'd be first out the hole. Anyways, during the last tank he survived, he was hospitalized and had an out-of-body experience. White lights, peacefulness, and then a loud voice telling him to go back, and that it wasn't his time. Afterwards, his spirit, went to my grandmother and told her he would be okay. She woke up, called my mother, and said that he had been injured, but would be okay. A few hours later, they got a call from the hospital confirming that he was injured but stable. My grandmother just passed away a few weeks ago, and my dad is really struggling, but I like to think that their connection was so strong that he warned her not to worry. Long ago was a terrifying night, I had the most chilling experience of my life. I was 15 years old, living in a small, quiet town where everyone knew each other. It was a peaceful place, or so I thought until that unforgettable night. My parents were away for the weekend, leaving me in the care of my older sister Emma. She was 16 and loved the idea of being in charge. That night, we decided to watch a movie. Halfway through, there was a knock at the door. Emma paused the movie, we thought it was just a neighbor or a friend. But when she opened the door, there was no one there. We shrugged it off and went back to watch our movie. We weren't bothered because we thought it was just some of the other kids playing pranks. Later that night, I woke up to a weird tapping sound on my window. I was a bit scared because of the dark, but I mustered the courage to peek through the blinds. There, in the dim moonlight, 
I saw someone or something in all black standing in our backyard, just staring at the house. My heart raced. I ran to Emma's room and woke her up. When we both looked again, the figure was gone. The next day, we told our parents about the incident, but they said it was probably just a lost traveler or a neighbor's guest. But I couldn't shake off the feeling that something wasn't right. The following night, the tapping returned, more persistent this time. It sounded like someone was intentionally trying to scare us. I told Emma and she called our parents, but there was no answer. We were alone and scared. Emma decided to call the police, but as soon as she picked up the phone, the tapping stopped. We felt relieved but still uneasy. We tried to sleep, but a sudden loud bang from downstairs jolted us awake. Emma grabbed the flashlight, and we tiptoed downstairs. The living room was a mess books from the shelves were thrown onto the floor, and the couch cushions were scattered. Then we heard a whisper, a faint, eerie voice coming from the kitchen. It was singing a slow, haunting tune. Emma signaled for us to sneak back upstairs, but as we turned, the kitchen light flicked on by itself. We bolted upstairs, locked ourselves in my room, and pushed my dresser against the door. We huddled together, listening as footsteps started coming up the stairs, slow and heavy. They stopped right outside my room. The doorknob rattled gently, then more violently. We were trembling, holding each other tightly. The house went silent for a moment, then a voice, soft and raspy, spoke from the other side of the door. I know you're in there, kids. We didn't respond. Then, the sound of footsteps receded. We stayed awake the whole night. We were so scared to breathe. In the morning, our parents came back and found us asleep in my room, the dresser still blocking the door. We explained everything, and they called the police. The officers found no signs of forced entry, but they did find footprints outside, beneath my window and around the house. After that incident, my parents installed security cameras and an alarm system. The police patrols in our area increased. But the scariest part was that they never caught the person who stalked and terrified us that night. Sometimes, when I'm alone, I hear a faint tapping, and I freeze, wondering if it's just my imagination, or if my stalker has returned. This happened in 2005. I got a job in Florida working construction. My day ended around 4.30 PM, and I was heading home towards Tamiami Trail through the Everglades doing about 35 miles per hour, and could see the intersection about half a mile ahead. I looked up and noticed three black unmarked helicopters flying low overhead, about a one quarter mile ahead. One of the helicopters turned towards me and I could see a red light start blinking on its nose. That's when the glitch happened. No more than a second later, I found myself heading towards the rear end of a vehicle stopped at the intersection. My foot was still on the gas, so I had to quickly slam both feet on the brake and hit the car going full on. I explained this to the cops, but they just looked at me weirdly and gave me a ticket. The only explanation I can come up with is that the universe reset and put me half a mile ahead of where I should have been. There have been other glitches since, but I'll get to them another time. Thanks for reading, every word is true. Got lost trying to find this trailhead in Montana. We lost GPS, which is always expected in the mountains. So, we were working off screenshots of the directions, but the lack of road signs made them useless. Moreover, I think we were already on the wrong road due to a lag in the GP's signal, but we didn't realize it before it was lost completely. Anyway, we found a trail that we hoped was the one we were looking for and started hiking. The trail got more and more sparse very quickly, and there ended up being flooding, making the creek impassable. We both kind of had the creeps, at least I did. The woods were so quiet. We turned around after 5-10 minutes, 
sure we were on the wrong trail anyway. Then, we nearly ran into a severed turkey leg, hanging nearly in the middle of the beginning of the trail. I don't know how we would have missed it coming in. There were no cars parked at the pullout but ours, and we didn't hear anyone drive by. It gave me the creeps because I didn't think we would miss something like that, but also, why would someone do that? It amused my partner at the time who took a picture with it, in a way that made it look like his hand. In North Cascades NP, I did an earlier solo hike. There was a small lot with one other car, and I never saw any other hiker on the trail, though I kept expecting to at some point. I didn't realize the trail I was hiking wasn't a popular one, so I saw no one. After about halfway, when the woods went quiet except for the trees creaking, I had the feeling like someone was watching me. I should have turned around but didn't. I was almost at the lake when I saw a bear den, and then realized the marked up trail and routes earlier were likely from a bear, not any trail maintenance or a hiker. I made it to the lake at the end, but couldn't enjoy it because I still felt like I was being watched. It really creeped me out that I had made it to the end of the trail without seeing the owner of the car at the trailhead. There were no connecting trails that I was aware of or saw. The woods were still quiet except for some small snapping branches or some small rocks falling across the lake, which added to my discomfort. On the way back, I saw a trail cam, assumed it was the NPS camera, perhaps for the bear activity I saw. I never saw anyone on the trail, except within the last quarter mile or less, I could hear the road. I about jumped out of my skin when I saw a group of three ladies, I couldn't hear them over the creaking trees at the beginning of the trail. Since then, on other solo hikes, I turn around when I get a creepy feeling I can't shake, or I go over an hour or two without seeing anyone on trails that are new to me and home to bears or mountain lions. In July 2004, Ricky Joyce, and I embarked on a hunting trip into a remote area of Breckenridge County, Kentucky. Ricky's grandparents' cabin served as our base camp, nestled at the foot of a hundred acres of dense timber. On the first morning, trouble struck when one of Ricky's dogs failed to respond to our calls. We discovered her lifeless in a ditch, her head grotesquely twisted. Puzzled by the unnatural demise, I remarked. There's no animal up here that can grab an animal by its chin, and the back of its head and twist it, you know, no coyote can do it, there's no bear, as far as I know up here. Strange noises, growls and screams had been echoing from the mountain's summit, prompting us to investigate. Equipped with our four-wheelers, we ascended to the hilltop to search for what might have claimed the dog's life. We decided we're gonna hop on the four-wheelers and stake out the hilltop. We ended up going to the far side of the property where nobody really goes. There are no trails. We make a couple laps around the field that way we can both easily see where the four-wheeler has been so we know where to look, I recalled. Despite spending a significant portion of the day searching, we found no traces of the mysterious assailant and eventually retreated back to the camper. As the night unfolded, strange occurrences intensified. Unsettling noises surrounded us, and at around 5 a.m., the dogs began barking furiously before fleeing. Our trailer was suddenly bombarded by an unseen force. It literally sounded like all hell was breaking loose. It's almost like you can hear something pressing up against the side, and you can kind of hear the tent start to bend. Just that weird, eerie metal sound. I described. Abruptly, the assault ceased, and an eerie silence ensued. Armed and apprehensive, we ventured out on our four-wheelers to uncover the source of the disturbance. Our search led us through the day and into the evening, crossing a cemetery and an open field. It was there, just after dusk, that we confronted the inexplicable. Ricky, spotting at first, recounted. I'd seen something standing in the field, and at first, I thought it was a tree. It was tall but also kind of hunched over a little bit. It was big. It was white. My own observations aligned, 
Its arms were long, but they were kind of out like this, and they had these long talons. It was too big to be a person. When it was on two legs, it stood at least nine feet tall. I mean, it was massive. When it noticed us, it let out this just ungodly gut-curling growl. It came straight at us. We opened fire in self-defense, hastily retreating to Ricky's grandparents' cabin. Uncertain if our shots had landed, we never saw the creature again that evening. I've been in some pretty scary situations, but most situations you know what you're dealing with. On that one I didn't, so I didn't know how to react. That's quite possibly the scariest moment in my life, Ricky reflected. It made me believe the unbelievable. I didn't believe in myths. I didn't believe in wives' tales, none of that until I saw that, and after that changed my life forever. I mean there are things out there, and we don't know what they are. Our quest for the mysterious creature continues to this day. Our story was even reenacted for an episode of Travel Channels, Monsters and Mysteries in America, featuring interviews with my aunt, Stacy Morgan, my uncle, Wayman Morgan, and a Breckenridge County resident, Susan No, who also recounted a chilling encounter with a sheep-like creature. Call me Jay. It's not my real name as I still do not have the guts to say my actual name yet. Today is the day I'm going to share my story. My first experience was way back in 1983. I was 14 and was on a youth group weekend camp in the Perthshire area of Scotland. The group is going to play a team war game called the A Wide Game Two Teams, each given a bucket to hide and protect and each team member is given a piece of colored wool as a life with the object to find and take their bucket back to your own. And if you take the other player's life, the piece of wool, then go back to the leaders of the youth group, and get another piece of wool i.e. another life and rejoin the game. The winner is the team with the most opposition lives and possibly their bucket the game lasts for a couple of hours. This particular game was to take place at night so each player should be carrying a torch. A torch so North Americans know, it's a flashlight. Before dark I set out up to the tree line, in some rhododendron bushes. As I neared the trees and bushes, I'm sure I saw someone watching me, but at that point, I wasn't scared. I thought maybe a deer. As I grew closer, I realized it wasn't a deer, but something that resembled an Ewok from Star Wars. Only the eyes and mouth were visible. Again, I didn't feel scared. In fact, I felt more intrigued. I said, Hello and I felt in my head, this uok like thing said, hello in my head, and I saw a small arm reach out and point to my head. I was about a couple of feet away from the dense trees and rhododendron bushes, and could only still see eyes, mouth, and arm. This creature's arm and hand were just about to touch my forehead, and then all of a sudden, I started to feel scared. The fear was rushing in waves and all of a sudden, from behind this creature, another one arrived much much larger than the other. In my head, all I could hear was, don't you dare, don't you dare, and then I saw the eyes of the larger being turn red and in her. I say her, as the feeling was this was this juvenile's mother. I wanted to scream but nothing came out. I was about a third of a mile from the campsite, and about 40 other folks from ages 12 to adulthood. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. I could see my fellow campers who were getting themselves ready to play the wide game as it was still daylight moving into dusk. The next thing I know is a number of the older campers saying my name, and touching my back. I was lying on the ground. The wide game was over, and it was dark around 11 pm. After a count of players, I was missing, and the group set out to search for me. It was an easy task as they found me because my torch was on and placed lying on the ground facing the camp, just about a foot in front of my head. The camp leaders thought I slipped fell and back smacked my head on a stone which lay near my head, and I dropped my torch, which was the way they found me. I was taken to the hospital, my parents called, 
And that was my weekend camping trip over. I can tell you, I never had my torch on. It was firmly in my trouser pocket. No need to use it as it was still light. What I think happened was the juvenile was so intrigued with me that they wanted to physically touch me, as I was intrigued with it. But the juvenile's mother was not happy with me, and its child, and the mama Sasquatch used some mind or body something to freeze me, slow down time, and my young body couldn't cope where I passed out. Being a mother, the Sasquatch took my torch out, and switched it on, as a way for the youth leaders to could find me in the dark. Now, 20 plus years later, and after 12 years in the military medic with the Royal Marine Commandos, I was in France helping my friends out at their stone farm cottage. On the third or fourth night, I decided to go for a walk in the woods which were at the back of her property. After about 20 minutes into my walk I froze. A voice in my head was, don't you dare. The fear within me was exactly the same fear I had when I was 14 years old. I've had lots of fear in my life and got over it, especially during my time with the military, but nothing like this. I don't know if it was the same Sasquatch or the juvenile grown up, as it was in a different country, different location, but it was exactly the same voice, same tone in English, not French, with no accent, but it was the same voice. It must have been just a few seconds in time. I didn't see anything, only heard the voice. I think I said, no, not again. Not this time. And I backed away and walked back, the same way back, to my friend's home. I didn't say anything to my friend however, she noticed my anguish and said. I don't like these woods. She only goes into them during the daytime when it's bright outside. So I suspect she's had an experience. I do not know what happened to me following my first experience of seeing the juvenile, and the mama if I was lying there all the time or taken somewhere, and I also believe when I think about it that it was indeed the same Sasquatch I felt in France, which sounds impossible. I think that these Sasquatch can port to any place in the world. How do they do that, I have no idea, that's way above my understanding. Hiking the Superstition Mountains which already have creepy stories of their own. There were no other cars in the parking lot or dirt area. So I was just with my dog. The trail I was following got confusing, and I was lead to a fence where it just seemed to end. Sun started to set so I decided to turn around anyways. Really stupid of me to go hiking alone, and this late in the day. But when I turned around to walk away, I heard something behind me so turned to look. Saw an older man with gray hair, a red button-up shirt and jeans, not really what you'd hike in or had no hat or backpack or anything on him walking toward the actual superstition mountain on the other side of the fence. I only saw his back and he never turned around. It was weird because he literally wasn't there one second and then the next he was and he wasn't walking on any type of trail or anything, just through straight desert. He didn't turn to look at me or anything, and since he looked so out of place, I got really scared so power walked back to the car. He was walking the opposite direction to where you get off the trail to park your car like going into the desert. There were still no other cars in the lot when I got to mine and it was pitch black out when I got to my car prob 20-30 minutes after seeing him. So what the hell was that guy doing? Everyone has told me I definitely saw a spirit out there, and that it's even weirder I didn't see his face. I wouldn't have probably noticed him if it wasn't for the red shirt he had on, because it stood out and caught my eye. Super weird. Haven't been back to that particular trail since it was one of the more remote areas of the mountains too. I know some of the trails are really popular, but this one you had to drive several miles off-roading to get to. In the late 90s, while very bored, my best friend and I would drive all over the place. We went down a dirt road in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. We drove for about 10 minutes, then saw a small trail. It was unmarked but very clear cut. 
So we hopped out and started walking. We weren't far at all when we started seeing those old spiral telephone cords in a bunch of different colors hanging from trees like decorations on both sides of the trail. We thought that was neat looking even if odd. The pine barrens are always odd. Then we saw old doll heads and stuffed animal heads nailed on trees. We were both nervous laughing but walked a little further where we saw a freshly killed deer with its head very cleanly cut off and its body sliced open so its innards spilled into the path. We all of a sudden got extremely spooked and ran back to my car as fast as we could. I was never so happy to get out of the woods as I was that day. My parents, back in 1969-1970, were on Interstate 10 heading east to Gulf Shores, Mississippi. While driving, around 10 p.m., this bright light attached to one giant, highly polished bronze vehicle, began descending from the sky in front of them, which caused my father to slam his brakes on his truck, so he'd not run into it. They saw this large vehicle cover both lanes of that interstate. The giant medium between the westbound lane covering the east lane on that westbound lane would have made this vehicle's width over 100 feet across. Mother was shaking. Being Christian, she never ever thought she'd see such a non-human hands made vehicle. Dad would say, not one sound came from that vehicle as it hovered in the air never touching the earth. The bright light dimmed, and they'd seen people in every window as we'd see people in jet aircraft when watching jets come and go at airports. Mother said, these beings looked human yet they shone as a sun would shine not as bright but angelic-like beings. They were afraid of what would happen next. Dad's truck had died the moment they saw this vehicle. As they watched, beings walked inside the large windows. Next, they saw this craft slowly lift upwards to a high 2300 up. And in a blink of their eyes, this vehicle flew off on their right side, and they leaned forward to see how high it was going at a breakneck speed. Next. They noticed this large beam of light came from another triple, the size larger highly polished bronze vehicle. It attached its beam to the one which hovered over them, and it seemed to have sucked this giant vehicle into itself. It closed its giant door and disappeared in front of their eyes. That's how fast that mothership had sped away. They were relieved when dad's truck began, and they drove the next few miles to Gulf Shores not speaking. Not until dad had unloaded his seafood to the restaurant, which had been waiting for my father my parents had owned a seafood shed in Louisiana west of New Orleans where he'd buy these seafood from local fishermen as his workers picked the blue crab meat, other workers tenderloin the fishes which came into his factory. I'd been their bookkeeper for their business. Mother was upset with my father for leaving so late into the evening hours. But, these restaurant owners wanted their supplies so early morning workers and 4 a.m. cooks could prepare the seafood for lunch and dinner hours. Normally my brother and friend worked for my dad and delivered the prepared seafood, but one was ill so dad knew he'd have to do the delivery. So hence, they were on the road to see an out of this world ship. My parent both lived well into their 90s. They never seemed to have been affected by the incident. Literally a random rickety ass flight of stairs in the middle of the swamp back home in Florida. We came across it on a hiking trip. We just thought it was odd and kept walking, assuming maybe there used to be a trailer there or something. Years later, I came across an article talking about why you never climb random stairs in the woods, and I went down the rabbit hole reading up on it. It was odd at the time, downright terrifying after I read up on it. I'm thankful to this day that we never went up closer to them or tried to climb them. Top my head, two things both found at the Red River Campground in Adams, Tennessee. If you're familiar with the Bell Witch, her cave is nearby. I was around 13 or 14 years old. The first night, 
My mom and I were walking to the bathrooms when I tripped over a cane just laying there in the middle of the grass. The next day, we went canoeing. We had pulled our canoes ashore and were taking a paddle break when I saw something sticking out from a tree. Upon closer inspection, there was a dead raccoon sticking out from a hole in the tree. I mean head down in the hole, tail in the air. This was super close to the infamous cave. My brother and I got back in our canoes real quick. Super super creepy. I had always dreamed of attending Coachella, the grand music festival that promised an unforgettable experience. However, with tickets often being exorbitantly expensive, I began to explore alternative avenues. This led me down a path that, in hindsight, I should have avoided. It was the start of a strange and unnerving adventure. One day, while browsing various online platforms for Coachella tickets, I stumbled upon an enticing offer. A guy, who went by the name of Max, was selling a ticket for a price significantly lower than the ones on official websites. My curiosity got the better of me, and I reached out to him. Max responded promptly, seemingly eager to make the sale. He provided me with an address where we could meet, claiming it was a convenient spot for both of us. The catch was that this place was an hour's drive away, but the cost savings made it seem worthwhile. I agreed to meet him, and we set the date for the exchange. The day arrived, and I found myself driving toward an unfamiliar part of town. The address Max had given me led me to a somewhat desolate area. As I neared my destination, I realized I was in for an unusual experience. The meeting spot was an unlit alley, sandwiched between a dilapidated warehouse, an abandoned motel with shattered windows, and a railroad with rows of rundown train cars. The place felt eerie, like something out of a horror movie. The area was completely deserted, and an unsettling silence hung in the air. I parked my car hesitantly and texted Max, informing him of my arrival. As I waited, I began to question my decision. What was I thinking, meeting a stranger in this eerie place for a ticket to a music festival? Time seemed to slow down, and I grew increasingly uneasy. I peered into the dark corners of the alley, my imagination running wild with all sorts of horrifying scenarios. Finally, a text came in, and I read, I'll be there in a minute. I sat in my car, nerves on edge, clutching my phone. Minutes turned to what felt like hours. And then, just as I was about to give up and leave, I saw a shadowy figure approaching from the dimly lit end of the alley, Max. As he drew nearer, I couldn't help but notice something was off about him. His movements were stiff, and his face was obscured by a hood. Every instinct in my body screamed at me to drive away, to leave this place, and forget about the ticket. I didn't need any further convincing. Without a word, I started my car, made a hasty U-turn, and sped out of that dreadful alley, my heart racing. The unease I felt during those moments was unparalleled. I couldn't help but wonder what had almost transpired. I later discovered that my instincts had served me well. I might have been desperate to attend Coachella, but I was unwilling to jeopardize my safety for it. In the end, the ordeal served as a stark reminder that not all offers are worth entertaining, and that sometimes, our gut feelings should not be ignored. This is kind of a horror story. I was moving out of my apartment and put my couch up for sale on Craigslist. My roommate had already moved out, and I was nervous about being alone and letting strangers come over to see the couch. There had just been some Craigslist killings in the news, so I hid easily accessible but hidden kitchen knives around the apartment in case I encountered some stranger danger. The people looking at the couch were perfectly nice, and of course I promptly forgot about the knives and went about my day. I left the apartment and ran some errands all afternoon. Whoops. 
My landlord decided to bring new tenants to show the apartment, and they were very confused or freaked out when they found large knives in several of the rooms. One in the bathtub, one on the foot of the bed, etc. Landlord was not happy. I sold a stroller and car seat combo. Woman shows up, takes a look at it, calls her husband to ask about some cosmetic work it needs, and if he could fix it. They agree to purchase it, and she hangs up with him. She hands me the cash, I showed her how to collapse it, and got it into her car for her, and she leaves. Ten minutes later she shows back up outside my apartment building, I had met her in front of the building, she didn't know my apartment number or anything demanding, I give her her money back because she changed her mind. Then her husband or boyfriend starts texting or calling me telling me to do the right thing and refund her money. I blocked the number and didn't respond. This happened a few years ago, but it still bugs me to this day. I had just graduated high school and as a broke soon to be college student, I needed some extra cash. So I took to selling all of my prom dresses on Craigslist. I received a call from someone who took interest in one of my dresses. So of course I answered the phone. Hello, I was calling about the blue dress you posted on Craigslist. I was a little surprised at the fact that it was a raspy man's voice saying this, but I didn't think much of it. I told him the size and the price, nothing crazy. He said that he and his mother were going on a cruise soon, and that they needed fancy cocktail attire for an event on the cruise, which isn't uncommon. So he was calling about the dress for his mother. Then he started asking questions, which at first I wasn't too concerned with, because if I were buying something that pricey, I would too. Here is a list of the questions he asked in order, and then my responses. Him. What size is the dress, me? It's an 8 but fits more like a 6. Him. How does it fit? Up top, me. Um. Normally, I bought it my size so I mean it fits me like it's supposed to. Him. What size bra do you wear, me? I'm sorry but that isn't relevant. At this point, I couldn't tell if he was genuinely still trying to figure out for his mother or not, and just wasn't good at talking, or if he was just a major creep. I soon get my answer though. Him. Well I was just wondering. For my mom, you know. Me. Yeah well your mom should know what size dress she wears before she shops for them. Him. Is it a tight dress? Was it tight on you? Can I see pictures of you in it? Me. Can't even form a sentence before he continues on. Him. And what about panties? Would my mother be able to wear panties? Ha ha, if you even wear any with it. I would imagine you didn't. Your voice is so seductive and slutty. Are you a slut? Creepy laughter. At this point I was so appalled, I couldn't even get words out of my mouth. Everything he said came so fast. I quickly told him he was disgusting, and to never call me again. I deleted and blocked that number, and deleted my post about the dress, and my Craigslist account in general. This is entirely too late to the party, but, while I was in grad school, we needed a third roommate. We posted looking for one on Craigslist, and lo and behold we meet Craig. Craig seems like a nice enough guy, friendly, conversational, maybe a little weird but affable enough. So Craig moves in, and we discover that he is on disability, I try not to pry as long as his checks clear for rent and utilities. Turns out, Craig has severe mental health issues. Now these issues themselves aren't actually a problem, as his medication does a good job. What the medication doesn't do well is mix with alcohol. Especially all the alcohol that Craig liked to drink. 
Within two months he'd been kicked out of three of the bars in town's small college town for falling asleep or creepy behavior towards women. Plus just having very off-putting behavior at home also. We never formally put him on the lease, so we are talking about asking him to either cut that shit down or leave. Fast forward to January, record low temperatures, and the coldest night in about 30 years for the region. Craig decides he's going to go to the bar, in the middle of a pseudo blizzard. It was both the holiday break, and about 20 degrees below zero. So all the bars were closed he would make these decisions at 11 pm, after I had gone to bed. Three days later we finally realize that Craig is missing kept a weird schedule, and I was just relieved to not have to deal with him, didn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. Well Craig couldn't get into any of the bars in town they were closed and got disoriented in the snow on the way back. He was found the next morning with his eyes frozen open in someone's yard, eventually losing all of his fingers and toes to frostbite, but lucky to be alive. The summer after high school graduation, I'm drinking at my friend's house with our gay guy friend. Me and the girl begin to pass out after a night of drinking. Our gay friend starts taking pictures of us basically sleeping on a couch together, and posts them to Craigslist looking for someone to come over for a foursome. Our gay friend eventually wakes us up around 3am in a panic, letting us know this guy took the bait, and is about to crawl in the basement window. Me and my friend start freaking out, and explain we are in no way down for any part of this situation. This guy turns out to be a registered massage therapist, and actually pretty down to earth. We find out he just went through a really bad breakup, and just wanted some company. We ended up watching the strangers while he did an analysis of our spines, and massaged the trouble areas in our back. So my mom is into sewing machines, like older ones. Well she finds one on Craigslist. She calls and wants me to go with her to pick it up. I'm 36 and live about 30 minutes away from her. It's my mom, and she says she has a weird feeling about it so I agree. We go to the shopping center, she is supposed to meet the woman selling the machine. We sit for a little while, waiting on the seller. Texts between her and mom go back and forth, and finally a car pulls up next to us. I'm in the passenger seat of mom's car. This car that pulls up has a dude in the driver's seat. He gets out, and is watching me the whole time. He opens the back door of his car, and I see the sewing machine box. Mom is freaking out a little, where she is she can't see the sewing machine. So I tell her to wait in the car. I get out and see a lady walking around the back of the car, she smiles and asks if I am here about the sewing machine. I laugh and say yeah my mom is and turn around to tell mom to get out and look at it, the guy asks if I got drug along to make sure it went right. I tell him yes that is exactly why I am there. He tells me his mom drug him for the same reason. The ladies hit it off and talk about sewing machines for 20 minutes. The son and I watched hoping the entire time they would stop. Until I saw the lady it was creepy, then it got worse. I never thought my Olympic dream would almost shatter over a casual encounter, but that's exactly what happened. The road to Rio was not a straightforward one for me. And it all started just a day before the Canadian Championships and Rio Selection Trials in Edmonton. My name is Sean Barber, a Canadian pole vaulter with aspirations of Olympic glory. The pressure of the upcoming competition was immense, and I needed a way to blow off some steam and relieve the stress that had been building up. So, I did something I'd never done before I turned to Craigslist in search of a casual encounter with someone who was, drug-free, and disease-free. Little did I know, this decision would almost turn into a nightmare. I met a woman online, and we agreed to meet up at a hotel. She assured me she was clean, 
and I took her word for it. Little did I know what she was hiding. As our evening unfolded, she began snorting cocaine, even doing it in the bathroom without my knowledge. We shared a few kisses throughout the evening, and as far as I could tell, everything was ordinary. We had a sexual encounter lasting about 30 minutes, and then I went on to compete at the championships the next day, determined to secure my spot at the Rio Games. I gave it my all and set a championships record, securing my spot at the Olympics. I was on top of the world, until the shocking revelation that followed. After the event, I underwent drug testing, and to my disbelief, the results came back positive for cocaine. It felt like a punch to the gut, and I couldn't understand how this could have happened. I was standing at the edge of losing everything I had worked for my entire life. The subsequent days were a blur of uncertainty, anxiety, and a desperate fight to prove my innocence. I was cleared to compete in Rio just two days before the games were set to begin. A panel eventually concluded that it was more likely than not that I had ingested cocaine unknowingly from kissing the woman. I had no way of knowing, and no reason to suspect, that she had ingested cocaine before our encounter. My Olympic dream was given a second chance, and I was determined not to let it slip away. In the end, it was a lesson learned the hard way that sometimes, even a seemingly innocent encounter can come with unexpected consequences. I had just gotten out of high school, and I was cleaning out my closet. I decided to post an ad on Craigslist. The title, Teen Girl Clothes for Sale. I received a few creepy messages but nothing too scary. Plus I needed the money so I waited a few days for a serious buyer. That's when Annie emails me. Her message said something along the lines of, Hey, can you meet in the Walmart parking lot? I'd like to buy all of your clothes today. I was so eager to sell them, but I didn't want to go to a parking lot alone. So I asked my mom to come with me, and she agrees. I let Annie know that I can meet anytime between 5 and 7. That's when she asks for my phone number, and I gave it to her. Back then I gave my number to anyone who asked, don't do that. So I'm texting this girl trying to arrange a time to meet, when she tells me that she has to wait for her mom to get home from work, so she can drive her to Walmart. I'm immediately relieved because I'm thinking, okay great, she's bringing her mom, I'm bringing mine, we're meeting in public, all is good. All was not good. We agreed to meet up at 6.30 at the far right side of the parking lot. I was excited to get rid of all these clothes and get some money too. We head to the side of Walmart, park and wait. I text her and let her know that we're there waiting, and the first red flag to leave should have been her reply. Are you alone? What kind of car are you driving? I tell her and I also let her know I'm with my mom. No response. At this point it's getting dark, and I'm looking around the parking lot to see if I can find her. That's when I spot him. A young man not much older than me, in a white Nissan parked on the aisle before us with his window halfway down, staring directly at us. So I ask my mom. Do you see that guy? Why is he staring? How much longer should we wait for Annie? She casually glances in his direction. Up until this point we had both been on our phones, not paying too much attention to anyone around us. I have since learned about the term situational awareness. Pay attention to your surroundings people. I figured she would text me when she was almost there, but she hadn't so I called her. No answer. Then the man in the aisle over rolls his window all the way down, still staring and starts to blow bubbles. Like actual bubbles. I can see him holding the container, gently blowing these bubbles in our direction. He pauses and smiles but not a warm smile, a sinister one. My mom and I take one look at each other, and I start the car. We begin to put the pieces together when we realize that this grown man in front of us is probably Annie. 
Not only does he have my phone number, but now he knows my car's license plate number. I'm trying not to freak out. He sees us pulling out of the parking spot, and he gets out of his car and stares us down, while we haul ass out of there. I was praying he wouldn't follow us. And he didn't. I guess seeing me with my mom threw him off, he thought I would be alone, and I'm so grateful I wasn't. I blocked the number, and never got another message from Annie. Needless to say, I didn't end up selling my clothes that day, and I haven't been on Craigslist since. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.